So let's go ahead and uh, call this uh, ACT Board of Directors meeting to order, our 9 November meeting. Uh, and for those of you online, we have uh, a big group of people here uh, up in Park County. It's pretty awesome. So thank you to Park County for hosting us. Appreciate that a lot. And uh, for everybody's benefit that might not have been here, we are in a beautiful building. Dick, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, thank you for coming up. Uh, we hope to do this again next year. Uh, I think you guys are, you know, PPACG is looking at doing this, and I would like to have you come up during the summer um, because there, there's some tours I'd love to be able to take you on, but I'm pretty sure the CDOT band can't make it because uh, <laughs> we've got some really, you know, we've got a lot of uh, really neat historic things going on in Park County as far as preservation. We have the, uh, the Paris Mill, which is, you know, one of the original mills that was up here when uh, World War II came around and they were running short of steel. They came up and raided all of the closed mills that were in Park County to reclaim the steel. Well, the Paris Mill was high enough that they couldn't get to it, so they didn't bother. And it is a mill that has actually got the original equipment in it. So a lot of the original stuff, so we're, you know, that. But uh, welcome to Park County. Um, your little detour you you took, we're sorry about that. I figured that because you were in a CDOT van, CDOT yeah. get you here, but uh, apparently not. Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, you did at least get to go through a spot, Antero Junction, which is traditionally one of the coldest, if not the coldest place in Colorado when winter hits. Uh, last year, we did have it hit 56 below zero there. So, But uh, this building has been around uh, about four years, and it was very nice to have it when the pandemic hit because we had most of the, the sound and everything set up. We're still working on things. Our work area down here is a little rough. We've ordered microphones. We were going to have them here. But um, I guess, you know, a month and a half lead time is not enough uh, in today's market. So we ordered something else to say, hey, this will work for this meeting. It's going to arrive maybe tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, welcome. And uh, I uh, really appreciate everybody that's made the trip up here. Thank you. Well, in, uh, in just a few moments, we'll do introductions. I noticed probably some people here from uh, Park County that uh, we've not had a chance to meet before. Maybe have only met occasionally. We'll do that here in a moment. Uh, but uh, what I'm going to do at this point is let's uh, establish a quorum. And Andy, if uh, we could go through that and uh, find out uh, uh, what we've got as far as uh, board members, uh, both okay. online and, and 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 present here locally. So please go ahead. Sure, I need some help with the folks online because I can't see them uh, at the moment. But I count for, uh, nine board members in person here, which is super. We need seven for a quorum. Uh, we'll go around and do self introductions here in just a moment, but. Um, yeah, I, I've got nine at least. Uh, let me leave it at that instead of calling out names uh, while we go around and do some introductions. Okay, very good. Well, um, why don't we start online this time, and then we'll go around the table here. And uh, it's a little bit too far away for me to see who was on there. I can just pull them out if you want me to. Yeah, that'd be great if you could. Sure, sure. we can go and start with uh, Commissioner Bremer. Yes, I'm present. Uh, Amy Mitchell. Here. Uh, it looks like uh, Ann Warner. Could we get, I'm sorry, Amy, could we just like who you're with too? Um, Park County Commissioner. Great, just do one. Hi, Amy. I apologize, Commissioner. You're on Zoom meeting as well. Um, uh, Dr. Duncan. Duncan. All right, Dr. Duncan is online, but I'll let you. Are you trying this. to unmute when you're driving on your phone? Chuck Arnold. Mm -hmm. Hey, Yoka Haig, Computers and Space Force Space. Uh, Eddie Edelman, and just kind of want to make sure that you, it sounds like you guys can hear us and we see you guys on mute, but if you guys can just confirm it. Yeah, time. I'm here. I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you. It, it was just cricket there for a while. Um, Jeff Guthrie from CDOT. 
Yes, sir. Present and online. Jacob Kirshner from CDOT. Hey, Jacob Kirshner from CDOT. I got Kathy. Uh, Lynn Rowe from City of Colorado Springs. Hey, good morning. Uh, Lynn Rowe, City of Colorado Springs, Acting Transit Services Manager. Laura Cruz. Laura Cruz, Mobility Coordinator for PPACG. Leslie. Hi, Leslie Patterson, uh, Invita Healthcare Mobility Manager. Patty Binger from uh, CSU. Yes, uh, Patty Binger with Color Springs Utilities. I'm also the vice chair of the community advisory committee. Chavez, I'm assuming that's Victoria Chavez, El Paso County. Yes, Victoria Chavez, El Paso County principal transportation planner. Wendy Pettit, CDOT. Good morning, Wendy Pettit, CDOT Region 2 planning. William Johnson, CDOT. William Johnson, Colorado Department of Transportation, Division of Transportation Development, Performance Mass Management Branch. William Mast from PPACG. Yes, William Mast, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Uh, Betsy Hayes. Hi, I'm Betsy Hayes. I'm the Director of Resource Development for Mount Evans Home Health Care and Hospice. This is the director, I believe that should be everyone who was online minus those who are in the conference room down at PPACG. Okay, great. And uh, we do have, the conference room is open, right? So do we have a few that are there as well? I believe we do. Uh, so if we could just ask the folks at the uh, conference room, the PPACG conference room, uh, to let us know uh, who is present there. Mayor Thompson, City of Fountain. Great, Fire good morning. Barb Watson, PPACG. John Graham, City of Manitou Springs. Excellent. And Danelle Miller, PPACG. Okay, super. Anybody else there at the PPACG building? That's it. Okay, very good. Let's go ahead around the room here and do introductions here, uh, here up in Park County. And maybe I can start uh, to my right at the far end and we'll just go around this way. Good morning, Jody Barker, Director of the Pikes Peak Area Agency on the Aging Part of PPACG. Good morning, Jenny Danner, Executive Director of the Park County Senior Coalition. Janelle Shaka, Administrator for the Town of Fair Play, and thank you for coming up to Park County. And so thank you, Tom, for offering to host this system. Andy Gunny, PPACG. Eric Stone, Teller County Commissioner. Paul Gardner, Fairfoot County, Town of Callahan. And was told that great great grandpa this morning. Wow. Just to make sure I heard that right. Great great grandpa. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You got longevity in your <laughs> Good morning. I'm Kelly Case. I'm Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Willow Park. Nancy Hengem, uh, City Council for Colorado Springs. Stan Vandewer, El Paso County Commissioner. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yolanda Avila, City Council Member for right. Colorado Springs District 4, and I also sit as a Board of Director for CSU uh, Utilities. I would introduce myself, Amy Mitchell, Park County Commissioner, District 1. I'm Todd Dixon, Mayor of Great Mountain Falls. Jeff Mosier with the City of Cripple Creek. Richard Zamora, CDOT Region 2 Director. Nick Elsner, Park County Commissioner, PPACG Secretary. Cheryl Richards, Office Manager at PPACG. Carol Finance Manager with PACG. Sure, Gardner, Public Information Officer. Great. And now we have a, a few folks also uh, further back to my left. And I don't know if the microphone will work there, but let's give it a try. Please introduce yourselves. Uh, for the Peanut Gallery, Jolly Santos, PACG. Good morning, Jolly Santos, City Board of Trustees, Jolly Santos, Peanut Gallery. Great, thank you. And John, we continue to appreciate your sense of humor. <laughs> That's the very distinguished peanut gallery on the left. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we've got complete, we've got a form for sure. Uh, we've completed our introductions. 
Uh, it's great to see a few folks here uh, from, uh, from Park, including some of the local folks that are running some of the activities you have going on up here. It'd be great to hear a few words about what you're doing up here in Park County at some time during the meeting. Let's make sure we take that opportunity to do that. But at this point, let's continue through the agenda. And our first item of business is the agenda approval. I'll just ask, are there any questions or concerns? Yes, Andy, uh, please. Mr. Chair, uh, if I could suggest one change moving item 7A, uh, 2023 legislative themes up to action 6F, so you can take action on your uh, legislative priorities for next year, that would be appreciated. Okay, very good. So if I understand correctly, uh, moving uh, 7A to 6F, so that it can be an action item. Yes. Okay. So moved. Second. And I will uh, work on the assumption that the so moved and the second does include that change. Okay, very good. All right. Are there any questions? Uh, one last chance. Any questions or comments on either the change or any of the uh, agenda? Hearing none, let's go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Great. And are there any opposed? All right, hearing none, the agenda is approved. Let us proceed now to item number 3A. This is public comments. Do we have anybody online that would like to provide uh, comments on any items not on the agenda? All right, hearing none, uh, let's uh, go to 3B. And it looks like we'll get a presentation from the Park County Transit Plan. That's awesome. Yes, and this is Laura Cruz, Mobility Coordinator. Um, I just want to introduce a couple of people in the room that have already introduced themselves. Um, Leslie Patterson, she is the Healthcare Mobility Manager for NVIDA. Um, they applied for 5304 funding uh, to do a transit plan for Park County, which one has not been done in, in many years. And so um, she has been working with the Fair Play Town Administrator, there, Janelle is in the room. Hi. Um, to work on a uh, putting together a regional coordinating council as well as putting together a, a transit plan. So I just want to turn that the microphone over to Leslie, and Leslie's just going to give you a very brief update on what that plan is is doing for the community and um, where they are in the process. Uh, thanks, Laura. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit and then I'll let Janelle, since she's in the room. Um, <clears throat> so we, like we said, we were awarded the um, the funding to be able to do this study. The last one was done in 2017. Um, and we hired uh, through a committee, Fears and Peers, to do the actual planning study. They have done the planning study in Summit County and Park County, so they're very familiar with the area. Uh, we had a meeting uh, two months ago in Park County that was very well attended and uh, tremendous interest in this plan moving forward. Uh, we just finished our survey uh, that was put out to the community and we received, I believe it was 326 surveys, 46 surveys. Um, and then in December 7th, we will be meeting again in fair play to discuss the results of the surveys, the findings, and then moving forward. So um, we are on schedule for the project. Uh, the project is to be completed by December, 2023. I suspect it will be done sooner, um, but we're getting some great participation and some real enthusiasm to provide some services up there. And I'll pass it over to Janelle. Thanks, Leslie. Actually, she had pretty much all of the high points that I was going to um, go over. I think for me, um, it's very exciting because it is um, just seeing the initial statistics um, and how high the turnout was already for the number of surveys that we got back. Um, there are already some clear routes that are emerging and some opportunity to partnership with some of the other entities in the, the county. Um, and so we're looking forward to having that meeting on the 7th and hopefully we could host that potentially here. <laughs> if you guys don't have a conflict, if not, we would be looking for uh, Northwest Fire Protection because those are about the only two places where we can have a large group and have all of the technology available. 
Um, so uh, we are hoping to get our final report, um, comprehensive report back from Baron Peers on the second so that we can meet as a group before we have that we'll, we'll coordinating council. But um, just want to express appreciation to everybody throughout the county who's helped get this word out. And um, we sent it out and I'm getting people still every day that want to be part of the discussions or on the actual coordinating council. Um, and so it, it's a fairly large group. And like I said, we are, it's exciting because we already can see a lot of emerging routes and a lot of possibilities. So, and then I'll talk a little bit more about some transit stuff going on at the fair play level when it's our time. Great. I'm, I'm just curious. Uh, you, so you have some routes that are emerging and obviously you've got to go through the process of completing the plan and so forth. But uh, what's maybe uh, one or two of those routes is something a local fair play thing or is it maybe between fair play and some other locations or what, what, what are you kind of starting to see? Within the county as a regional um, destination, it is fair play because this is where all the services are. So it's the outlying communities wanting to come here, um, citizens. Um, I think there, what we saw was also between here and Alma, there's people with daily commuters, um, but also between here and Hartzell. And so, but we also, what was interesting to me, Bailey wanting to come here. So there's a pretty significant amount of, of ridership. Um, you know, we asked a lot of different questions, like where, what, uh, what your uh, employer is, or if you're retired, we have a highly um, large population of retired and elderly. And so we see a lot of opportunity to partner with, um, or do something for them to be able to take them to the, either the front range for, um, for appointments or, you know, just shopping. So, but uh, yeah, I think Hartzell and Fair Play and Alma and Fair Play and Bailey and Fair Play, but it's a lot of people wanting to come here. Okay, that's interesting. And I'd also know that, and I'll just ask the question, uh, I think some people do live uh, here uh, and uh, work in Breckenridge during the ski season. So you might already have something that looks like transit that does that already, or is that part of the plan? <laughs> The summit stage, um, they're up to three three day three daily runs. Three daily runs between Fair Play and uh, Breckenridge. Okay. Uh, we started it five years ago. It was when we first got into the negotiations. Um, and you know, Park County contributes some to it. Uh, Fair Play contributes. Alma contributes. Uh, Breckenridge contributes. And Summit County contributes. They, they're the, I think, the biggest contributors because they see the, the advantage for them. Uh, our housing is a little cheaper than over there, even though we don't have any available. There. <laughs> but uh, it, it's something that we we started started with one. They upped it to two. Now it's at three. And uh, I'm anticipating that if if we get more housing over here, it'll go higher. Uh, but you know. <laughs> We've been hit pretty hard with short-term rental and all of that, so we 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 don't have the housing available to help them because we don't have enough housing for ourselves. And I think it's important. Also, I just I wasn't at the last uh, taper meeting, but seeing some of the statistics for the outrider and the busting from the Front Range to the Western Slope—that's a highly utilized route. So, I think with all of that, we have an opportunity to do some things. So. Great. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. That gives me a sense of kind of what that plan might ultimately uh, produce as far as recommendations and so forth. So let me just open the floor. Other questions from any of the board or anybody, any other members that are here regarding this item 3B, the Park County Transit Plan. What's the completion, expected completion date? Yeah, December uh, 2023, but we expect that it should probably be uh, completed ahead of time. Okay, great. Nothing moves quickly. Yeah. <laughs> well, in good planning, you got to put the time into it to make it right. So, uh, uh, any other questions regarding this item? It's very interesting to hear about it, too, by the way. All right, hearing none, let's move on to the uh, consent items. The first one is item 4A, which is approval of the minutes from October 12. Are there any questions from any of the board members regarding uh, last month's minutes? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. Thank you, approve. Mayor Dixon. Thank you. 
I'll second your vote in the case. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Let's go ahead and proceed with that vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes from October 12th, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Are there any opposed? All right, that passes. And let's move on to item 4B. Actually, these were supposed to have been acted on as a whole, and that was my error. I was just going to say, that the consent items. I, I was yeah, no, no, that's, uh, I'm just items. making a mistake. <laughs> so accept my apologies for that. Uh, when you voted on 4A, let's vote on 4B. Uh, do we have any questions uh, regarding item 4B from any of the board members? All right, I'll entertain a motion for move. Okay, Eric That's been moved and seconded. Let's proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 And are there any opposed? And that also passes. Thank you very much. Uh, let's move to item five. And this is our military installation reports. If I heard correctly, I think we had at least one representative from our bases uh, that's online. Uh, yeah, this is um, Eddie Edelman. I'm the mission support group deputy. Uh, the only thing I would think the superintendent would want me to report is that Air Force beat Army and the superintendent's trophy is back at USAFA, of course. And uh, also our Corona conference went very well. We had over 90 general officers from the Air Force kind of planning the future uh, of the Air Force. So that went well. And other than that, I don't have anything else to report. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and um I think uh, I heard was Andy that did you mention it to me in the bus coming over about uh, the Woodmore area? Oh, uh, we don't need to go into it yet today. Oh, yeah, okay. the Woodman Valley, Woodman Valley, Valley exploring a study. Yeah, we'll we'll talk we'll about talk that. about that uh, yep. uh, um, at another sure. at another time. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the update uh, from the Air Force Academy. Um, do we have anybody else online from any of the bases? All right, and we don't see anybody on there trying to get their microphone working, do we? Okay, very good. All right, any uh, any comments or questions for uh, our representative from the Air Force Academy from the board? Well, let's see, Commissioner Chuck Arnold, looks like you came off on mute. Okay, uh, Mr. Arnold. Um, does he, does he look like he's still on mute or? Looks like Mr. Arnold, if, you, if uh, it looks like you're unmuted in Zoom, but we're, we're not able to hear you. And he did say he was having technical issues earlier. So, okay. Uh, yeah, he just confirmed. Okay. So he's got a text there, which I can't read. It says he has technical issues. Yeah. Okay. So what we'll do is uh, if uh, Mr. Arnold can resolve those technical issues, just ask him to chime in and then we'll give him an opportunity to give a report. Uh, but let's go ahead and proceed with the agenda at this point. And hopefully Mr. Arnold uh, heard that. So if, uh, if you get those resolved, just let us know. Let's move on to item 6A, uh, uh, fiscal year 2023, a budget, Carol uh, and budget, and this is Carol McGrew. Okay, right along. Hey, um, so what time, um, proposing today is the 2023 draft budget. Um, in your packet, you will find the memorandum. You will find the um, draft budget details by line items. And you will find the draft budget totals at the 6% wage average <coughs> increase, 7%, 8%, and 9%. Um, in addition, starting on page 19 of your packet, you will find the first draft um, of the major projects and um, priorities that were listed for 2023. And the final um, draft of the work plan, which is what that document's called, will be presented next month, but it's just for your review now. Um, so I'd like to just go over some highlights of the budget instead of a creative slide. We know that revenues decreased close to $2 million from fiscal year 2022. It was due to cutbacks um, of the COVID pandemic emergency funding. We just wanted to remind everyone that dues, uh, member dues, remain the same as um, last year. The um, kept full FTEs budgeted at 39, and otherwise there were no other major budget changes. Um, and I've given you a summary of um, the expenses um, based on each percentage of the proposed wage package increase, basically at every percent. The um, expense increases by about 33,000. 
dollars um, a year. So my recommendation today is that we would discuss it and approve um, one of the percentages for the wage package increase. But before I open it up to um, discussions and questions, I'd like to go over what we the process that we've been through to get here, just to kind of remind everybody who might not have been here in the past. It basically started back in October of 2021 um, when we hired employees council to do a salary survey. That survey was completed in March of 2022. It was determined that most of the salaries were in line with the market. Um, but the, those that were not were adjusted accordingly. And then August of this year, we started to review our preliminary wage expectations. We looked at the CPI, which at the time was up 8% from the prior year. We also reached out to um, the members um, in this group and Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog to get an understanding of what their wage expectation increases were going to be. So then in September and October of this year, I came to the board and we created a draft budget at the six, seven, eight, and nine percent increases um, at the request of the board. And internally, we have determined that we are taking the nine percent off the table because we believe that um, it shouldn't be considered due to the negative effects it had on the direct cost and to the overall budget. So here we are in November, um, and we did complete a comparative salary analysis on five different um, positions internally. We compared to the city of Colorado Springs, and we paid and compared to the county. And the results showed that um, PPACG's mid-range salaries are within or below the cities and counties. Now, I, I, we, individually, but I can talk about that. We didn't want to put it as a, 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 a spreadsheet or to show that to everybody, but um, I. I there is backup for this if anybody wants to see it. So really, with that, I'll open it up for discussions and questions. Okay, and uh, uh, do you have, are there any questions from any of the board members with regard to this? And this is something that we'll have to make a decision on, and I think it would be prudent that we make that decision today to just uh, checking to make sure that that is appropriate. That we need to make that decision today, right? Right. I mean, it has to be adopted by the end of the year. Um, ideally, we don't like to wait until the very, very last minute in December, like we did last year. They're kind of, as far as us getting organized and getting ready for the new fiscal year, kind of puts our, our backs up against the wall. So ideally, if we can come to a decision today, if the board can, that would be, that would be super. Nancy? Yes, I have a question. This is Nancy Hedgem. Um, does staff have a recommended percentage increase? <laughs> you take a 9% off, and you give me a reason for that. You have a recommendation. Um, yeah. So we we talked about it as an organization, and we um, are recommending the eight percent, and for a couple of reasons. But we did not do a mid year adjustment, and it is a reasonable. It's reasonably in line with what the city and the county has reported um, as our increases. So we're uh, recommending eight. Yes, sir. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, Couple of things for uh, for those who are, remember from last year, um, we had a robust discussion which led to the delay of adopting the budget on the, the amount of the of the the increase on wages for PPACG employees. And at that time, it was I would say preceding what was to come with the CPI. Um, the, the the CPI uh, you know came in much, much higher than what anybody anticipated that it would have been and it's continued. So I, uh, and I was one of the ones last year that was very much advocating for a very moderated approach to those raises, not going crazy. And then I turned around when we did our county budget and we actually did much larger raises than what we did at PPACG because that's what, you know, that's what our studies were, were showing us. Um, you know, I, at this point, I mean, I would support the, the 8% increase. Um, I think not only because of, I felt like, I kind of feel like we're a little behind where uh, the marketplace was and inflation was and where what was done with other uh, governmental agencies around the area. You know, not only did we do our, our salary increases, but we also in the county uh, did give a retention bonus uh, to employees utilizing ARPA funds. Um, and I think there was a lot of other organizations that kind of did something similar where, so 
you know, again, there's no mid-year adjustment. There was no, uh, you know, retention bonus or anything like that, that from the pandemic that uh, that uh, employees for PPACG saw. So I think uh, it would be appropriate to uh, to do the eight percent because of all of that. A motion. Thank you. Yes, uh, Commissioner Ellison. Yeah. Um, you know, it's more than Park County can afford. But then last year, I think we did a little bit better than PPACG. And, and the way I look at it, um, dues aren't going up and we're able to do this. You know, if, if my dues were going up 8%, then I go. Uh, but because, you know, we're able to absorb it and, and give that 8%. Um, and then, of course, people that work for PPACG live in El Paso County, Colorado Springs area, which is totally different as far as, okay, you guys didn't give me a raise. There's lots of places out there that they, they might be able to find another job if, if they aren't happy. And uh, we have got such a terrific staff now at PPACG. Uh, you know, the, the help that they provide, all of the work that they do, I would go along with uh, Commissioner Snow and say that the 8%, I think is a, a good number. Great, thank you. Uh, and uh, let me just uh, check, and again, it's hard for me to see. Do we have any hands raised, or do any of the board members that are online okay. have an interest in commenting? The you guys thumb up. John, do you have an opinion? <laughs> Can you see my thumb? No. Thumbs up. John and I are giving thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Nancy. So um, I know we can continue to have a conversation at the risk of moving this too quickly. I would like to move that we accept the staff as well as the papers. Second, Mayor Dixon. All right, so we do have a motion and a second. Uh, and that motion, uh, uh, can you we couldn't, we couldn't hear the motion. Oh, thank you. So uh, there is a motion and a second to accept the 8% uh, wage increase. And then uh, let me, uh, Andy, you correct me if this uh, if I state this wrong, but if we resolve the wage percentage component of it, we still have to consider the budget itself as well, right? We're in court of all one motion. You've got three or actually four different options of budget sheets. It's a single budget sheet in your packet that has a 6%, 7%, 8%, 9% assumption built into it that is what would be approved. So you're basically approving the budget for 2023 at an 8% salary pool increase. That, that could be done in all one motion. It, it could be done in one motion, but there isn't necessarily anything wrong with this being its own motion as well. Well, that would be my motion. Is yes, and, and that would be my second for that <laughs> motion. <laughs> all right. So we have an amended motion and an amended second to include the 8% salary budget increase and also approving the overall budget proposal. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to do is now make sure that everybody gets an opportunity. If there's any other questions about the budget or any questions about the 8% increase, but now this is a conversation about the entire budget. You just need to make sure that people have a chance in case there's something else in the budget they wanna ask questions about. So let me open the floor and see if there are any comments or questions about the entire proposed budget with 8% salary increase. We know I, uh, I was uh, not at last month's meetings and it looked like you ironed it all out last month is what it sounded like to me. Um, okay. <laughs> Just to make sure that you see any hands raised or anything, I, I can't see them from here, but any hands raised from online? No, sir. no? okay, very good. All right, it doesn't look like we've got any further questions or comments with regard to the 2023 budget with the 8% salary increase. Let's uh, go ahead and proceed with a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, and are there any opposed? Congratulations, look at that. We completed our 2023 budget determination on five. Wow. Well, and, and thank you, and on behalf of the staff, it's an amazing staff we have in place right now. I, we've been through some things the past several years and um, we've got an amazing team now. So they appreciate your support. Um, they hear vice versa that you appreciate what they're what they're doing. You've got a draft of our work plan priorities in here that's attached yeah. to the budget as well. We'll bring that back next month and go through that in more detail and talk about the priorities for 2023. But um, yeah, we really appreciate the board's uh, support that of all of us. So thank you. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Appreciate the board's uh, deliberations on it as well. 
that makes things very simple and easy for us uh, in, in our December meeting, which is great. Shall we proceed? That, that anxious year was from. Um, that's right. Yes. Well, no, no, yes. Excellent. All right. So let's uh, move on to action item 6B, which is tip amendment number three. Um, and uh, Commissioner, did you? I just see you standing, so I'm not leaving and I'm not requesting to be. Okay, very good. <laughs> Our chairs are not comfortable. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm still uh, in the, the mode of recovering from the latter fall of July 2022. So sitting for long periods of time is not great. Very good. So the standing was not a request to speak. It's just. So we're, we're, we're not done, are we? No, we're not done. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, so we go through the presentation for tip amendment number three. No. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, today we have a, a tip amendment for uh, just one project change today. Uh, we have a, a project um, from El Paso County. Uh, it's a fleet um, electrification project. Uh, this project was approved by our board and uh, went through the committee system when we awarded a uh, multimodal options fund uh, dollars earlier this year. Uh, in some discussions with CDOT and El Paso County and PPACG, um, we were kind of advised that this project doesn't, there was some concern that the project doesn't really fully meet uh, the eligibility requirements of the MMOF. Um, and so we kind of came up to the recommendation that we would uh, swap out the funding source. So what we're doing, what we're proposing here is swapping out the uh, multimodal options funding uh, for carbon reduction program funding. And this carbon reduction program funding is a, a new funding source to us um, that was established uh, under the, the new infrastructure uh, and jobs act. Um, and I did want to point out quickly that the uh, the amount of federal funding has changed a little bit because of this swap out. Um, so originally the MMOF has a higher uh, local match requirement. It has a 50% local match requirement. Uh, the carbon reduction program uh, has a 17.21% local match requirement. And PPACG staff is recommending that we uh, award this funding in the um, in line with that lower local match because uh, if El Paso County had applied for this funding with this project, they, they would have um, chosen to do the lower match. This has been discussed at TAC, TAC agreed. Um, it has been through CAC. Uh, and at this time, if you have any questions or, or comments, I would be happy to answer them. I believe uh, Victoria Chavez is also on the line. Great, very good. Are there any questions from any of the board members regarding the tip amendment three? Okay. I mean, it's essentially a fun swapping. Oh, I apologies. Uh, apologies, please go ahead. So does that mean that the MMOF funds are now going back in the pool to be available? Correct, yes. The MMOF funds have come in or will, uh, pending this approval, come back into uh, the pot to uh, become available. We do have a... Uh, existing notice of funding availability out and we have let everybody know we anticipate this amount of funding it's it's 525,000 in MMOF right we we anticipate that uh, being available okay great uh appreciate the question and the response to that are there any other questions um yeah yes uh you want to match on that is that Go back to El Paso County, or is that from from PPCG? Yeah, I, I I don't know much about that from my you know work at the county, so maybe I can ask the PPACG staff to respond to that. The local staff is from the jurisdiction; it's from El Paso County. But the the MMOF dollars, I think, is what he was asking. Uh, the MMOF is uh, from the state. I was asking about the current project. Oh, oh. sorry. Okay. So, do you want me to jump in there now? Yes, sir. So, yes. Uh, 
The MMOF had a different match rate. I believe it's 50-50, but I don't have a packet in front of me. So El Paso County was paying um, half and, and the MMOF was the other half. By moving to the carbon reduction, which again, I'm just using ballpark numbers, moves to an 80-20 match. Mm -hmm. Had we known that CDOT would have had the pushback on the, the MMOF in the first place, El Paso County would have gone after the carbon reduction in the first place. Yeah. So the TAC discussion was, and it, and, it, and it concurs with the staff recommendation, was that El Paso County needed to be held harmless because this is quite frankly a, a CDOT issue. And again, I'm not throwing stones, but so in, in the transfer, El Paso County does get more uh, uh, regional funds and then, can, and then is, has a reduced uh, match that they are paying. But given that, uh, again, none of this was on the table in the first place, the TAC discussion was to hold them harmless and make sure that they got the higher, the, the higher um, regional fund amount. Now, obviously, El Paso County has a ton of projects in the TIP, so that was the other part of it is it's not like they're going to take that the match money and put it in their pockets. It's going to go to other projects. So with that, uh, if the board's cool with that explanation, we're great. But if not, Victoria Chavez is on the line and can chat more about um, the El Paso County. And, and I think the other part of it, but we've kind of mentioned it already, is that it would be releasing uh, 525000 from MMOF, which then becomes available for uh, whatever is an appropriate project, which could be any board member's uh, public agency here, right? Yes, sir, that is correct. And again, my understanding is El Paso County is not going after that 525. So they've released it and they are not making application towards it. Okay, great. Um, are there any other questions uh, either for Victoria or just, uh, you know, in general? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, in MLF funds. How do you apply for the other plus twenty-five thousand per? So we release a notice of, of 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 funding availability, and there is an application. So again, these are uh, funds that are um, restricted to within the MPO boundary. So those representatives that are within the MPO boundary. Um, receive notice of the funding being available. If you are one of the few jurisdictions that are outside the MPO boundary, um, since you weren't eligible, we didn't send out any notice for it. I'll ask you a question. You just Sorry. to muddy the waters a little bit more. These are Pardon? These do, just to muddy the waters slightly more. These are ARPA dollars that are in MMOF, so they have a short time frame, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And they have to be obligated in 2024. And then spent by 20. And expended by the end of 26. Yeah. Okay. And it's still 80, 20 percent? 50, 50. 50, 50. Again, I, what I've told all the, the, the jurisdictions within that, obviously that 50, 50 is something that can be um, waived the by the state transportation commission. We're happy to go to our transportation commission, Lisa Hickey, and ask her to help us with that process. So don't be scared off if you're within the boundary and you are eligible. If you're, don't be scared off by that 50-50. Tell us what your project is, and we can see what we can do to help. Councilwoman Angem had a question about what's the boundary, the, and what does that mean, boundary? So the, the boundary is the urbanized area as defined by the census. So every 10 years, our boundary changes slightly when the urbanized boundary um, as um, realized by the census changes. Um, there is a process we go through to officially adopt it. Okay. But basically it's an urbanized area. And you now get ready to either pop up a map or, or, or help me if I miss one. So the jurisdictions within the MPO are um, Teller County, El Paso County, Colorado Springs, Manitou Springs, Mountain, Green Mountain Falls, Monument. Monument. Since we had a question from the mayor pro tem from Callahan, Callahan is outside. I believe so. Yes, you're outside the urbanized boundary. So. <laughs> that being said, you are in the boundary for the Central Front Range. Poor Callahan. You're your person for that. The Central Front Range is the TPR under which you're covered. And, and again, I know we're stretched for time. 
So but basically, at some point, I can come back and give you sort of a funding, how money happens here. I, I just will pour the heck out of you. You can record it and use it for nap time later. But needless to say, the way we do it is by by different by 15 different geographical boundaries. You are in Central Front Range. Uh, Commissioner Elsner is your representative. Well, some of you are within TPR number one, which is the Pikes Peak MPO. We're still in the El Paso County MTO boundary, right? No, you're you're within the Central Front Range. So C dot slash Commissioner Elsner, the ones that help. But I'm always available to help. I I never take off my hat and say I won't help. So just let me know what you need. Yeah, basically the, the central front range is everything that's not included. You're in the not included park counties and the not included Teller County, a good portion of it okay. is in the not included. Everything except the local park. Yeah. You know, so it's it's the rest of it. And and that's where we use the central front range money is in the areas that not that are not part of that. That density essentially. Yeah. So Yes, if you have projects, that's, you know, we went through the MPO where I think you got sidewalks. Yes, we did. We got, uh, we got a grant from uh, CDOT on that. Yes. Yeah, so the MPO, not the MPO, the, yeah, the, uh, the planning region. Yeah, the TPR to get the MMOF money. Um, yeah, the MMOF, MMOF money for your, your sidewalks and those type of things. So that's where you, you come to the central front range with those type of requests. And when we have the money, we send out the, hey, we have money. Yeah. You know, January is your annual meeting. Maybe there will be a lunch and learn before or after or in between where I can pour the heck out of everybody about all the different boundaries and all the different funding sources. I'm happy to do that. But that's when we'll have new board members coming on board. Um, if that would be a uh, help. I didn't know that uh, you won't board me when it comes to money. Uh, well, that is, <laughs> I, that's exciting news that you all. <laughs> 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 Let, let the record state that the mayor pro tem from Calhan will not be bored on any budget discussion. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I think I saw a text uh, or something from someone online. Gail, do you want to ask that question? Otherwise, I'm happy to. Uh, yes, I'm. I, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to make sure that, as I recall, there was another part of that discussion about uh, the carbon reduction fund going to the county, or I'm sorry, the, the release of carbon reduction funding that had previously been awarded to Mountain Metro, um, and they released those funds so the county could receive them with the understanding that they would receive this available um, MMOF funding for their original request. And I just wanted to make sure, I, do I have a misunderstanding on this or is this something different here, John? Carbon reduction hasn't been awarded yet. I, I know that MMT and oh, okay. a, 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 uh, applying for the full amount, but it, it hasn't been awarded yet. Okay, great. Thank you. I needed that point of clarification. Great. Thank you for that question. Appreciate it. Is, is there, are there any other uh, questions from online? Did you ascertain? Yeah, that's all. I saw almost speak so, but that's it. Okay, great. So I'll just open the floor again. Any more questions with regard to item 6B? Uh, yes. I just, uh, I just have a comment. Um, yes, this funding is all really confusing. Um, I had CDOT down to Fountain a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and they went through my, with our staff a lot of the funding options and what the matches are and the abbreviations. I think it really helped my staff. So um, if, if there's just a lot of confusion with the ARPA dollars being in with the MMOF and all that, consider having um, a, a Zoom meeting or having them over to your place because it's really mm -hmm. helpful. Yep, happy to do it. I appreciate that comment, but I tell you what it is kind of uh, suggesting is Maybe it is something that would be appropriate to agendize for a future PPHG meeting, some kind of uh, more detailed conversation about the different boundaries, and different colors of money and, and everything else so that uh, the board members for PPHG can have a little more, uh, a better well, Yeah, but, but our staff, our your, staff, your staff needs it to know what to apply for so they have a full understanding. So it needs to be, but it might be one of those commercials we talked about PPHG making with staff that we can all just walk. Um, you know, that we can all just watch and um, at our own leisure. 
Okay. Sure. I was going to suggest, yeah, we, you know, there could be a high level presentation too. And if there's individual entities within uh -huh. PPHG, like a, you know, a staff level kind of presentation to sit down individually, right. you know, CDOT would be available to do that as well. So in case that wasn't clear for anybody online, uh, CDOT is offering to give those presentations to your public agency. And let's see if we can we'll do something about getting something up for PPACG. That's your right. Thank you. And Commissioner Stone, you had your hand raised. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a motion to approve Temp Amendment Number Three for fiscal year 2023 through 2027 as presented. I'll second that. All right, that has been moved and seconded. One last opportunity for any comments or questions, and also just confirming we got nothing. That's still have nothing else online. Okay, very good. All right, hearing none. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't know if that was an anticipation for the vote. I'm sorry. Commissioner Brecker, you unmuted, but that might have been anticipation of a vote. Anticipation of a vote. Thanks. Okay. There we go. Okay, very good. Thank you. So let's go ahead and proceed with the vote for item 6B. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And are there any opposed? Outstanding. So let us, uh, that passes. Let's go to 6C, the form nominating committee, or the nominating committee to form a nominating committee for the 2023 board officers. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it's that time of year where you prepare for new board leadership for the upcoming uh, year. So today the action is to appoint a nominating committee. Um, I will mention I put out a, a request to board members uh, a couple of weeks ago for those who are interested in serving in a board um, leadership position, chair, vice chair, second vice chair, treasurer, secretary. Uh, to let me know by next Monday, the 14th, if they're interested in, in serving next year. And so far, I've gotten responses back that five are interested in serving. We've got five positions. Um, I've had two members express interest in serving on the nominating committee, Council Member Yolanda Avila, and also Board Member uh, Mayor Dixon, uh, but also uh, Mayor Dixon expressed interest in being on one of the board uh, leadership positions. So I would suggest you probably would want um, two additional ones if you need to hold back from being on the nominating committee. I think if you have three board members that aren't seeking a 2023 uh, executive co uh, committee uh, position, uh, if you have three that can form a nominating uh, slate, uh, that, that should suffice for today's action. Okay, do we, uh, do we uh, uh, need to find three and then vote on that today or do we uh, are, you looking, two, are you looking probably, to settle with? Probably, yeah, two more volunteers in addition to Councilmember Avila. Okay, great. I would suggest. So let me just open it up for the floor. Are there any other of uh, the board, any other, excuse me, any other board members that are interested in serving on the nominating committee for the 2023 officers? Kind of the guidelines we're doing for this is that if you're, you put your name in for interest in leadership, then you're not available for the nominating committee. Kind of correct. I would, I would recommend that. Yeah, because otherwise, you know, so that limits the number of people in the room. If, if those does. five people are in the room, there's fewer people. So my, my recommendation is if you didn't put your name in, you might want to consider serving on the nominating committee because we're running out of people. <laughs> well, that being yeah. said, this is Commissioner Bremer, and I will be happy to be on the nominating committee so that I'm not on anything else. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to be voluntary. Huh? We, we do have an El Paso County Commissioner who would like to be on the nominating committee and to use her presence on the nominating committee as a forcing function that she's not going to be pursuing an officer position, if I heard correctly. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Remmer. I appreciate your volunteer. That is two. That's two. Ideally, one more two could do it, but three would be better. Yeah. Pressure. And I think three would be great. And uh, to be fair, we have two uh, that are from the front range. And, uh, and maybe uh, we could get a third that is not from the front range. And then it's a little bit about balance. I'll be happy to say. Okay, very good. The mayor pro tem from uh, Woodland Park, uh, Kelly Case. Uh, uh, if there, are there any others that would like to? So we might have, have to have a discussion. But let me just open the floor and see if there's others. Also, uh, volunteer. The way I can learn what's going on. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Now we have uh, three positions and four volunteers. Uh, and uh, for those online, that was uh, Roland Gardeen uh, from Calhan is also uh, willing to volunteer to serve on the nominating committee. Uh, is there any objection to having four? Four. I have Kelly, Cammy, Roland. Cammy, you said. I got Cammy, Yolanda. Oh, Yolanda, thank you. 
I, I move we approve those four. Second, Eric All right, there is a motion and a second to approve those four. And uh, we do hear a background conversation. My apologies. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, four that are nominated. I want an email address. Uh, and that is uh, Council Member Yolanda Avila, uh, County Commissioner Cami Brimmer, Mayor Pro Tem for the City of Woodland Park, Kelly Case, and Mayor Pro Tem, Town of Callahan, Roland Gardine. Any other last comments before we proceed to a vote? Moving along to me. All right, hearing none, let's uh, all those in favor of uh, um, uh, nom uh, having those four as appointed to this nominating committee signify by saying aye. 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 And are there any opposed? Very good, we've got a committee of four. Outstanding. Let's move on to 6D. And this is the Communities Working Together Annual Awards Select uh, Annual Award. And we need to select a review committee. And Andy, this is for you to describe as well. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the board started this a couple of years ago to uh, give out a Communities Working Together Regional Award each year in December during your December meeting. Um, we just pushed out the notice and we're gonna keep amplifying that to let the community know that um, nominations are open now. Folks can nominate anybody in the region for somebody that really exemplifies working across jurisdictional boundaries. Um, but the action for today is to look for a couple more volunteers, uh, three, uh, two or three uh, to work with me to review applications, nominations that are submitted and then make a recommendation for um, providing that uh, award at the uh, December meeting. Very good. And uh, do you have any uh, any uh, volunteers at this point? Did, uh, uh, we haven't asked for any yet. So we haven't have any yet, okay. but um, yeah, open to. All right. Uh, so this is open. Uh, should be uh, board members, I presume. Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Stone. Yeah, I'm sure I'd be, I'd be happy to help. Okay. That is one. Outstanding. Yes. Uh, I'd be happy to help. And Commissioner Elser, that's two. Well, Mr. Chair, this is John Graham. I serve on that. I'm sorry, I missed that. Who was that? John Graham. It's John, John Graham. Graham. Mr. Thank I serve you. on that. Who was the first? That's, uh, that's three. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, again, how many were you interested in? It doesn't uh, make much difference, uh, maybe. A handful, uh, three ish is good. It was three last year. Three last year. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we do have three volunteers, but I still want to just leave it open in case there anybody else does have an interest. Who was the first one? I didn't understand it. Who was the first one? Stone. Uh, Eric Stone. Eric, thank you. Eric Stone. Okay. okay, very good. I'm not hearing uh, any uh, others uh, expressing an interest. So we do have three and we do need to vote on this. So I'll entertain a motion at this time. Also move for the... Okay, very good. And that is moved and seconded. Thank you so much. Uh, one last opportunity for comments or questions. And hearing none, let's go ahead and where, proceed with Where the is the application available? Uh, this is Jared Burner from PPACG. So the application is currently on the website. Uh, it's just under the, uh, there's a couple different places. There is a news release that went out on the first. I uh, went on social media, specifically LinkedIn, because that is a fairly good platform for an award of this nature. Um, but it is on our homepage, off to releases, um, as well as a standalone page on the website. Thank you. Okay, very good. Any other questions before we proceed with the vote? All right, let's go ahead and proceed with that vote for item 60, although 6D. All those in favor of approving those three volunteers uh, for this uh, review committee, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, thank you. Are there any opposed? All right, outstanding. And we have now item 6E, and this appointment of treasurer to fill a vacancy, uh, and this is an unexpired term through 2022. And if you'd like to give a little bit extra explanation on that. Sure, so we amended the agenda uh, a little over 24 hours ago to add this item. Uh, Mayor Don Wilson from Monuments um, had been our treasurer this year and, and last year as well. He is stepping down from his position this week to fill 
an unexpired legislative uh, term, not the one that he won last night, but a separate one, but then he'll fill his other term in January. Don't worry, not a rabbit hole, but um, we could literally probably lose any other board leadership position if somebody had to step down, except for treasurer. Tre treasurer is really important because that position has to sign off on our check runs that we do twice a month so we can pay our bills. Uh, pay our credit card bills and utilities and, and everything else. We need a treasurer to fill out the balance of uh, 2022. And then with the nominating committee that you just appointed in the previous item, uh, two items ago, uh, they'll figure out who the treasurer would be in, in 2023 for the full term. But it just, we need somebody that's willing to step in for the balance of uh, this year's term. Okay, great. Yes, sir. Um, are the signatures Ink or, or can they be electronic? Electronic approvals are just fine. We send out twice a month our accounts payable uh, list of checks that are in the queue for approval, and I sign off on them. Carol sends out an email, and we just seek uh, an electronic uh, response back. Um, do you, this is Sharon. Do we have anyone that uh, that put in their name to do that in twenty twenty three? Commissioner Stone has from Teller County. <laughs> so we have to talk about it. I make motions to put in as our favorite treasure. <laughs> Eric, would you be willing to start a little earlier? Yeah, I'd be happy if that's what the board would like. Okay, great. And uh, uh, and just uh, before we actually uh, uh, get to the motion, Dick, but I missed that one. I know a council member Avila had a question, so go ahead. No, and that's I I was a treasurer for two years, and I learned so much to see where what the bills we had and where they were going, and you know from everything to insurance to copiers to what we do with AAA. I mean, just I learned so much by being a treasurer. So I would encourage. Anyone that can, I'm glad you're doing it, Commissioner Show. However, uh, in the future, I wouldn't shy away from it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate those comments. Those are great. And uh, can we accept Commissioner uh, uh, Elsner's motion? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a motion and a second uh, uh, for Commissioner Stone to fill this position until such time that we have our officers a slate and a vote uh, for next year. Who, right, made the, who made the motion in the second? We didn't all catch that down here. Uh, it was uh, Commissioner Elsner made the motion, and it was uh, Mayor Pro Tem Roland Gardine from Calhan that made the second. Thank you. You are welcome. All right. Uh, any last comments or questions on this item? All right. Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor of those uh, of this appointment, please signify by saying aye. 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 And are there any opposed? All right. Outstanding. Let's move on to now item six F, which was modified from seven A this morning. So it's listed on the agenda as seven A, but it is. Uh, 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 formally at this point, 6F. We're seeking action on this. And actually, before we get into the weeds on this, I don't know if John was going to handle this or Janelle, but just want to mention as well, item 7B, pavement condition, target setting. Uh, we kind of were a little bit presumptuous, but uh, decided to hold off on having that pre presentation today. Just sort of did that on the fly just now since um, we were running a little bit behind as far as getting started this morning. This item, the item 7B, can wait another month or two until we have that presentation. I think we've communicated back to the CDOT folks who are going to give that presentation. So after the legislative items, uh, we would suggest just jumping into um, updates from our partners in Park County and um, our other agencies here. Okay. Okay, so uh, so what you're doing is you're proposing 7B. Right, it was information only wasn't going to be action for today. We're just okay. going to be on condition and target setting that we have to do at some point here in the next couple of months. But John, we would, we would continue with 7C. Correct. Okay, That's right. Yep. And then 7A was moved to 6F. Right. Yeah. Okay. With that, John or Danelle? I think Danelle's going to handle this. Okay. If I'm wrong, then I, I will shoot from the hip. Danelle? <laughs> I, I will walk through it and, and then I'll let you jump in if. Uh, if necessary, John. Um, so we've uh, been developing this uh, legislative themes and, and priorities uh, brochure with our legislative committee, um, which has, has met uh, a few times through the late summer and fall. If you take a look at um, this page, thank you very much. Uh, our, our legislative themes, it's 
quite similar to, to last year, but there has been some uh, updating. Uh, Mayor Thompson just noted that we need to uh, change the treasurer uh, under current board leadership out. Um, but our intent with this is to uh, have the board approve this today if possible, uh, so that we can go ahead and get these printed out for our legislative round table, which is scheduled for November 29th. Um, and if you go to the second page, please, there we go. Uh, there are a couple of items here in yellow. Uh, so there were some discussions during our community advisory committee meeting uh, to change a few, um, change a little bit of the wording to, to better reflect um, how, how they felt it, it uh, change the wording to hopefully better reflect our intent. Um, so we did take a couple of words out that um, were in there on uh, accident. And then, and then we made a couple of changes here. Originally this said a uh, regional quality of life and we updated it to say maximize quality of life through local control. And then we also added in this sentence uh, a couple of words. So it reads, local government is in the best position to determine local needs to attain high quality of life and the funding for those needs, opposed state mandates that usurp local control. Um, and at this point, if anyone has any questions, if anyone from the legislative uh, committee would like to speak uh, to the initiatives or the priorities, that would be wonderful. Great, thank you very much. I'm, I'm just uh, super excited we're getting it done so early this year. Um, we can print a few, and then if we need to make changes, we can come back and print a few more, but I'm excited to, to be this far along in the process. Great, thank you. And uh, if I could, uh, these uh, just make sure I, I understand it clearly. These are the recommended changes from the legislative committee, is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. So that was deliberated over by our legislative committee, which is good. Um, are there any other comments from any of the legislative committee members that you'd like to made with regard to your proposed changes, Commissioner Stone. Yeah, not specific to uh, the brochure or the, uh, the information that's been put in front of you, but um, just want to make sure everybody's aware, especially because we're getting ready to go into the holidays, and as soon as the holidays are over, legislature's in session. So, you know, next month, who knows what people are doing, the holiday parties and that, but um, we are hearing rumblings on multiple fronts about the legislature making a move on establishing state land use regulations. This is a major assault on local control, which is the key component of you know, our legislative priorities is to maintain local control. Every county, every town is unique and different. And uh, we believe the uh, legislative committee uh, has already talked about this. It's already being talked about at CCI. I'm sure maybe even CML is starting to talk about this as well. Um, but it's something that uh, we're gonna, all going to need to work together on if maintaining local control over land use regulations is a goal of this organization. I know it certainly is a goal of Teller County. So I just want to make sure that everybody's aware of what's coming based upon that we were, those who didn't want that to happen were hopeful for a little different outcome from the election. It appears that uh, the early returns on the election is going to give uh, a significant uh, continuing to have a significant amount of power uh, in the majority party right now. And we are being told this is a very high priority for them. And so it's something that we all need to be prepared to comment on, you know, uh, to send letters, to pass resolutions, do whatever we can to put heat on the legislature and its committees in regards to land use regulations and the maintenance of, of local control over those. Uh, I, and I'll just make the point, I appreciate those comments and I'll uh, echo some uh, comments. I think actually it's, it, it does depend on what they ultimately propose as to what level of concern that I would have, right? But I can think of situations where they might do a one size fits all statewide kind of requirement that then forces a local governments down a particular path that guarantees lawsuits. For example, so uh, uh, that there's there's things that uh, uh, would be really really a huge problem, and it, I, I don't know what they're trying to pursue with this. Although I can probably guess on at least a few items, 
but I think uh, we can, for example, stand firm on the importance of letting local government do their job. Let local government do their job. Yes, Commissioner. Yeah, I think I think one example is um, the push to have a statewide WUI code. I like to say WUI. People look at me and say, "What the heck is that?" But it's a wildland government interface. Uh, they want to have one code that uh, fits all, which when you get into an area like Park County, we, I mean, if I had to do some type of code in Park County, you look out at South Park and say, okay, that grass never gets very tall. That's not a big problem. You look on the Bailey side where we're 75% uh, nat nat national forest and we have houses that are on private property that have a lot of trees around. That's a different situation. They want to have one that fits everything. Uh, I think that's just one of them. There are a couple other things that are coming up that they're, they really want to do. And that is something that um, Governor Polis has said that he really wants to get rid of local control when it comes to land use because it's stopping them from being able to say, you are going to have multifamily housing in this area. Um, and, and that's one of the other uh, issues that we have is, you know, rural, how do we handle that? Everybody here is on a well, uh, with the exception of, you know, just a couple of places, Fair Play being one of them. Um, and then to say, well, you're going to have, uh, you got to have multi-family type housing in this area. Well, we don't have the water available, so how do we start trying to figure out state's requiring it but we can't do it so we can't get funds for a project that we want to do that fits us because the state is saying oh no you have to do this so it is a very big thing coming up with local control and trying to to you know keep the legislature and the the, the state government in their lane so we have our lane because we're the ones that know best what is you know what we need in our communities i appreciate those comments Yes, sir. Uh, the count table is on uh, 1129. What location? It will be at PPACG at 2 o'clock in our main conference room. Okay, great. We'll have yeah. snacks. <laughs> I wouldn't even add, add to the concerns. Town like Green Mountain Falls, we're looking at the wildland urban interface codes. We physically can't comply with some of them because of the size of the lots. It's certainly. It's a yes. physical impossibility. When when you have to cut down your neighbor's trees yes. <laughs> to keep your house safe according to the codes, and it is a problem. And destroy your neighbor's house. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's that's yeah, What's your standard size lot 25 by 125? Yeah. So you're cutting down your neighbor's tree. And uh, in particular, I'll make the point that <laughs> wildland urban interface, we have a very unique situation with the Pike National Forest, a massive, massive amount of population next to a gigantic national forest. Uh, it is unique. There's nothing like it anywhere else in the United States. It has unique needs, unique requirements, and needs unique action. And a one-size-fits-all state-controlled response to a wildland urban interface, I don't know what that will all mean in the end, but I know it's not going to work in this unique situation in the in the Pikes Peak region. There's going to be something about what they propose that, that isn't going to work for us. I just know it. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, no, I just would like to uh, uh, propose a motion to approve the PPACG 2020. <laughs> Get him back on track. <laughs> <laughs> Second. And council Second. member Chip just wanted us to move forward on the agenda. <laughs> Very much. Uh, who was the second? Okay, thank you. Case. Bear for Tim, uh, the LA case was the second. Are there any last questions or comments on this item? If, if I might just put a final yes, point on please. what uh, Mayor Thompson said, we will do two printings one for the meeting on the 29th with the current officers. And then once you go through your annual meeting and have a new slate of officers, we will, we, we will do a second printing. And we will send those up with Dan Jablan um, and make sure that they get distributed appropriately. Yeah. And um, I, one last comment is that the 29th is a Tuesday. That's when uh, El Paso County has its board meetings. So uh, sometimes we finish in time, but I'd say two thirds of the times we don't finish by two o'clock. We did move it. 
I know. Because I think our initial date was going to conflict with the major land use hearing. Yeah, you uh, moved you moved it from a previous Tuesday to a later Tuesday when we have our board meeting. So Tuesdays. Oh. I'm confused. I'm confused. I'm confused. I thought the 29th. I thought the 29th, so 29th is a Tuesday, and that's when you moved it to. Because I said, "Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's yeah. fifth Tuesday. A, we don't have a meeting on the fifth Tuesday." Yeah. And again, my apologies, Spec Commissioner. We did the best we could. We had um, uh, our legislative co-chairs. So we were working with Commissioner Elsner's schedule. We were working with uh, Mayor Thompson's schedule, and we were just trying to do the yeah. best we can. So hopefully it, it will end and you will be there because, again, we did move it because it is very important for you to be there. And hopefully we, we have a very we have a role for you in the actual proceedings. So okay. if you're not going to be there, we can, we'll can shift. Well, let's just be hopeful. Yeah. Uh, but I don't I don't know what the agenda will be that at that point. Uh, so I, I can't. Uh, confirm for you if it'll be a shorter meeting or a longer meeting, but it's actually two meetings. Um, and uh, we, we have on, on that particular day, we have a, uh, well, actually, so it might be, it might be that we will not hold the second meeting in the afternoon because it is the fifth. That was the whole uh, Tuesday. We chatted a few yeah. weeks ago thinking that there won't be a land use. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, so it might, it might be okay. So okay. I, I might keep the fingers crossed. Yeah, let's keep the fingers crossed. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we have a motion and a second. I think we still need the vote. Uh, so all of us in favor uh, with the motion to approve this package here, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 And are there any opposed? All right, very good. Let's now proceed to, uh, that passes, and let's proceed now to item 7C. This is updates by Park County and the towns of Fair Play and Alma and the Park County Senior Coalition. Shall we just follow along the order that's presented there? Um, I think that's fine. We didn't have a set order. I know Jenny's here at the Clark County uh, Senior Coalition. Jody's going to introduce another guest that we have online. That's another AAA service provider as well. We didn't get yeah, a final confirmation when we printed the agenda, so we'll have the name of the organization at point here. But yeah, well, we could go. Andy, we can follow in any order you'd like. To. Okay, so go ahead. it's ready to go. I don't know if uh, Commissioner Elster, you want to say a few words, and we can. Um, well, you to... mean about the, the senior coalition and everything they're doing? <laughs> and other things uh, <laughs> that you want to. You know, about. it's. Um, I I always have to to say something because <laughs> it was a couple of years ago that our senior coalition was totally falling apart, um, and it was because of. Uh, I think PPACG and, and actually forcing the issue because as county commissioners, we didn't have a whole lot to say about it. We could whine, which we were doing quite a lot of. Uh, Jody's predecessor was helping us whine, but it got down to a point where um, it was broken in Park County and PPACG took a very difficult position and said, we are not going to fund you unless you get your act together. Um, and that kind of woke everybody up. And we now have a, a director who is, in my feeling, absolutely spectacular. The senior coalition is getting back. It's working really hard. Um, I had conversations um, last night with some people over on the Bailey side because you know, we've got this pass in between two population centers and the Bailey side has most of it. And they were, they have the, the Platte Canyon area, senior citizens, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. Um, and they were, they asked me, they said, you know, we're thinking maybe of just kind of disbanding because Jenny's doing such a great job. I told them, I don't want you to disband because you're kind of a local group, but yes, work with the senior coalition and come up, become a much better, stronger group for Park County and bring the two sides of the county together where we actually can say everybody is being served. And I think that's where they're heading. And after at that, I'll keep a nutshell. <laughs> um, yeah, and if you want to, I don't know, if you want to expand on anything else uh, kind of Park uh, County related as far as other priorities, maybe outside of well, the AAA realm? The, well, the, the biggest priority I think we have is housing, just like about anybody. Um, the, you know, we live next to the big dog in housing and, and short-term rental, uh, Summit County. If everybody thinks, well, Denver is, uh, at least Summit County has got, I don't know, 10,000 short-term rental units in the county. 
it, it's absolutely amazing the problems they have, which of course creates a problem on our side because we need housing, uh, we need a lot of housing to be able to fit in. So that is one of our biggest problems is, is housing and trying to figure out what uh, we can do for you know seniors or one, but our workforce, because we have a heck of a problem keeping a workforce. Uh, we've got some initiatives going. Uh, I have discovered there are some agencies that uh, make government look like it moves quickly. Uh, it's not PPACG, it's for the other people we're working with. Uh, and, you know, we've got a couple of projects, but it's, to me, the biggest issue is housing. And then the second one, of course, is transportation, which they're working on. Um, and, you know, they, they get inside Park County. Yes, we have, you know, areas trying to get to fair play. Um, our clinic at fair play is now approved by the VA to do VA things, which has helped quite a lot because instead of our residents having to go down to Colorado Springs or to Denver, they can come to, to fair play, but then how do we get them there? But I've also, uh, there's an issue with people wanting to get to Colorado Springs um, from this side of the county. Other side of the county is not quite the same. RTD is starting to ramp back up on the bus routes so people can get down to Denver if they want to ride early in the morning, come back in the afternoon. And we do have other things, but, but trying to provide transportation for people to get from here to, uh, to Colorado Springs is one of the big ones. I think uh, Buena Vista is, is another one. But you look around and we have a, a grocery store in, uh, you know, in, in Fairplay. Well, that's the only grocery store in Park County. So that's an issue. We have a fair in fair play. We have a clinic. Absolutely great. We created a health services district. Um, there's a sales tax associated associated with it, which keeps our clinic running. Uh, we're adding a pharmacy, which is unbelievable because it's you know we've never had a pharmacy um, <laughs> back maybe when the hospital was here, but that was so long ago. Um, so I mean, we're we're adding a lot of those services. But it's just, um, you know, a lot of it revolves around the lack of workforce housing. We can open someplace up, but unless you can have, you know, get someone to work there, um, it doesn't stay open. And that's our businesses are having a lot of trouble with that. If I could ask a question, because, I, you know, short term rentals and so forth, big issue all over the place. And it seems to me like there's a growing number of public agencies that are starting to implement uh, some type of regulations, you know, less severe, more severe, whatever it might be. I, I, I have the understanding that several have done that within PPACG. I'd like to just find out who has implemented those. There we go. Yeah. So, yeah. A city of Colorado Springs. We're in the process. Our party County. is in the process. Yeah. Yeah. Park County has process. one implemented. Yeah. Park County has one. Fair Play has one. And I know that. Yeah, Green Mountain Falls, you guys just approved one, right? So it's a good number. Uh, I can tell you that um, El Paso County is in an internal conversation about um, short-term rentals. And I have asked staff there to uh, try to get what others in the PPACG environment have, have done in their neighborhoods um, to kind of get a, a sense of you know, what people are considering. Sure, and I'm happy to, um, Mayor Dixon sent me uh, theirs uh, just a couple of days ago. I haven't sent it out to the full board, but if others want to send their uh, ordinances my way, I'm happy to share them out to uh, members of the board and the city and town county managers as well, so they're all working off the same uh, recent uh, adoptions. I can tell you, we have, a, we have accumulated a wealth of information from other jurisdictions um, for our consideration yeah. um, in the process of I mean, to see, trying to come to see some consensus um, when you share each other a lot of information about what others have done. Um, not sure what that, I mean, it, it may be consolidated and helpful. Um, if it is, I'll look at it again. And, and if it would, would be of value, I'll share that with you then. Would that be all right? Oh yeah, absolutely. You can share it with others. Yeah, one of the things we found, and we did the same thing um, through a different eight, eight, eight the tourism group got together and and so a lot of the ski resorts were involved where short-term rentals is part of their plan 
Um, it's just gotten out of control. And it really comes down to some of the communities we work with is the, um, the amount of hotel rooms you have and how much tourism you actually have. So there's communities like Buena Vista who's trying to manage their short-term rentals because they don't have hotel rooms. So they need uh, those spaces for people to stay because their tourism has exploded. Um, Cripple Creek, we've got hotels going up. Uh, and so for us, the short-term rentals is an important business concept, uh, but we don't think we need to grow until the community grows because we have hotel rooms. Uh, so it's, it, it really depends on the community and what is available, and what your tourism looks like. And then it all boils down to balance. Yeah. 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 And um, uh, El Paso County uh, held a town hall with uh, the Cascade uh, Association. And uh, we had uh, an amazingly huge amount of attendance, like yeah, 100, yeah, yeah, those are nice. about 150 people oh. from the Cascade area. Yeah, it's awesome. yeah. Uh, and uh, and they were expressing. Uh, yeah, everybody was left, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so now there were short-term rental owners there. Uh, expressing concern that they would be overregulated, and then there were a lot of people there expressing concern that they don't have enough housing. And there was some statistics presented, and I think it did include Green Mountain Falls. But out of the in that area of approximately 1,400 uh, homes that are available, 500 of them were short-term rentals. So about a third of the entire housing stock in that area is STRs. Well, that's when you look at it. Um, you know, Rab County, Steamboat Springs and, and all of that. Steamboat Springs has uh, an issue with short-term rentals. Rab County doesn't because they're prohibited flat out. You cannot have a short-term rental in unincorporated Rab County. Uh, so you have, you know, that one, you have Denver, which says, yes, you can do short-term rental, but it has to be in your primary residence, period. You can't have a house that you're using a short-term rental. So it's kind of all over the board as yeah. to, uh, you know, who's who does what and who's trying. But as I say, you know, Summit County has got, I believe, over 10,000 units, uh, which is, you know, from a, a standpoint of taxes, it's, it's kind of nice for the sales tax. But that was the, uh, the task force on tax policy last year looked at short-term rental and really it's a, a commercial business uh, and what would it take if you tax it commercial? And that would be, I think we came up with uh, a, a huge amount of additional funding for Summit County and their school districts if they, you know, if the legislature changed that, which was that whole discussion. I don't think the discussion is over. I think it's going to continue on for a, a few years. Uh, I've heard this year that um, there's going to be a bill that is going to require any agency that lists short-term rentals be licensed with the state and provide the list of short-term rentals to the state. So a county then would be able to say, okay, Airbnb, this is all of theirs, BBRO, these are all of theirs. And any other group that does that has to like be uh, give that information to the state so the counties then can start identifying them because it just, trying to identify what house is a short-term rental is a huge deal. If you're in a, a metro area where you got a lot of neighbors around, that's not too bad. But when, you know, your average lot is five acres and nobody sees who drives up and down the driveway, it's really difficult to get a handle on it. Um, so, so we, we license them uh, in Park County. We've got up to, I think, 350 applicants now, but we anticipate that there's 1,300 in the county. So we have the software that yeah that drills through those advertising sites to pick up uh, yeah. properties that are within our jurisdiction yeah. to reach out to them so that well, you know, everyone's on the same playing field. So that's I we did that too. I, did you? Yeah. But th this is this is well. yeah this is having the state have it a requirement. I see. Yes. So then the counties can access that database for free. So, you know, any money you're spending, because we did the same thing. We hired someone to help us identify, but it's kind of a, you know, yes, we think we got them all, <laughs> but this way, the biggest players would have to give you the numbers. Yeah, but other than that, uh, Park County is a, a beautiful place. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, you're all at, uh, you know, close to 10,000 feet. Um, so, you know, if you have trouble breathing, that's tough. Uh, <laughs> you drive down the hill really fast. But, uh, Dick, can I ask you a question about your uh, ordinance and short term? Sure. Um, you mentioned you've got about 350 registered, but you think there's around 1,300, which implies what, a 25% compliance approximately? Um, with, with your ordinance, are you guys are you being proactive? At the kind yeah, of, yeah. The the next stage of it is, and actually we had this discussion driving over is is you know the just the added manpower of enforcement at the moment you decide to regulate. Um, so the, you're saying you're doing it now, but what what does that look like for you guys? Well, the, of course, the we were slow on the uptick because we didn't have uh, enough people here to do that. As you start getting money in, then you can start saying, hey, we can really justify having someone in charge of that. Uh, and we're now down to a point where we're starting to issue letters to people that we have a pretty good idea they're a short term rental and haven't licensed. So we send them a letter and say, you know, you've got this period of time to license it. If you don't, there is a, uh, I think it's a thousand dollar a day fine. Um, which we're hoping encourages them to do that. And, you know, it can be a summons rather than having to take it through the court. Um, but, uh, you know, our, our fee is only, it's $600 to license for the first time. And then every year after that, it's 200. So, you know, we're trying to be reasonable, uh, but we've got to get a handle on it. Of course, in uh, rural areas like us, when it's a well and septic, that is our problem because you have 18 people in a house that can really hold six um, and they don't understand that you have a well, but if you, everybody takes a shower at once, it may dry temporarily, it has to recharge and you've got a septic system that if you have those 18 people take a shower, now you're sending it down the road. Uh, so it, it's all of that. But. So what we did, um, Commissioner Stone, is we've contracted with Granicus, which a lot of cities have been contracting with them and they manage that capacity they'll they'll submit the letters and, and everything for you obviously it's a contract um but it does help you with capacity instead of hiring a staff person contracting so they do um 70 different sites there's a hundred that they have access to that they do 70 sites to try to determine what your usage is um it doesn't what what we found is people are going underground now and so they're renting their short-term rentals out via email and so they're going through their cousins and relatives and friends around the country and getting their houses. So they're not, they're still avoiding the business tax, lodging tax, all of that. Granicus, how do you spell that? G R A N I C U S. I think the other thing that I've heard that they're doing is somebody is like, oh, yeah, I'm leasing it for six months, but then they are leasing it out on some yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I can get it to you, Kelly. Thank you. Guys. One of the things that Green Mountain Falls implemented is for requiring a licensed short term rental to post that license number in any yeah. advertisement. Yes. Yeah. yes, we have to. And that's that in our regulations. Yeah. Or proposed regulations. Yeah. That we and that, that should assist us. In small community, we're going to know right away. Pretty much. And one last question on, and I've read your guys' ordinance, but uh, on the glamping side in, in Teller County, commercial camping outside of, uh, of a permanent area uh, is not allowed. Uh, assuming you have something similar at Park. Um, We've got land use in, uh, as far as if you're gonna do a campsite, um, you have to go through all of it. Uh, if you're, uh, if you have a house and you, you can't let people camp on that property. Um, I mean, there's some things around it that we got, we kind of had to just, it's like, yeah, but my grandkids come up and they like to pitch a tent and camp out on the property. And we kind of, yeah, you know, so we've, we've got some things around how we do that to allow, you know, family members type thing. But if, if you aren't related, then that's where you start getting into, you're renting the space. Yeah, you know, we have a specific camping ordinance that, uh, you know, addresses, uh, well, it helps us with squatters, number one. Uh, but then also is you know, like limits the amount of time that somebody can camp on their own property, but no commercial is allowed whatsoever for the ordinance. Yeah, so, and, and residential, that's the way ours. 
and we do have it, uh, our camping is you can camp on your property from May 1st through October 31st or something like that, but you have to remove your camper. Um, but you can see how effective that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, Question, I, I don't know if this even exists, but does anybody know of anywhere in the nation any kind of incentivizing programs um, to help people who just have these short-term rentals that are sitting empty to, to actually serve a workforce? Or um, yes, there are a few places in Colorado that do that. Do you know anything about are they effective? Uh, not really. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's a case that's expensive. Uh, to do, and you get one house. Um, and I know, uh, I think Summit County was looking at that. Uh, I believe Route County is doing something like that too. But, you know, the, the resources you have are kind of limited. Yeah. Uh, Aspen may be doing it. I, and I'm, some of, you know, my thoughts and comments, and I, you, you may have discussed it briefly when I had to step out and take up this phone call. But, you know, it, you know, on the one hand, you've got private property owners who have free rights to use their property as they see fit. And then you have the, uh, on the other hand, uh, going to such a place where you really have kind of moved from a land use decision or a residential area into a commercial operation that really now is usurping um, uh, design that public agent, local public agencies do to have a good, uh, good environments, good neighborhoods, and a balance of what is it, whatever is needed. And uh, this is now the application of a new technology, these smartphones and this kind of stuff that have enabled this. So this is actually kind of, in my mind, a, a technology development that has kind of um, now embedded itself into what a lot of local governments have been doing for a long time to try to manage you know proper balance between different kinds of products so this now gets down to when is it still a private function and when is it a commercial operation i don't think that's been answered yet yeah well we have in, in our yeah. land use um if it's residential you can't have a commercial business um you can't have a home business but we have limitations around, you know, what type of activity you can do. So if, if you're doing a pottery shop in your home, um, you can do it to a certain point, but then it becomes commercial. And if you're in a residential, it doesn't work anymore. And what's happening is people are taking residential and turning it into a commercial activity. And the commercial activity now is in a residentially zoned district. So that is one of the, the, the problems you have is, okay, how do we do that? Uh, how do you figure that out? Because, you know, I'm a strong believer in property rights, but um, I've had a lot of people come up to me, especially that live up in Alma and some of those areas that say, you know, we don't recognize a neighborhood anymore because it's now mostly short-term rentals. So when we go out and walk, we've got all these strangers. And then of course we have the issue that, hey, it snows here snow gets deep people rent a car in denver they come up they can't get to the house we the sheriff's department you know we aren't a towing business no you have to call someone to tow you uh but we, we have that issue and then while well, they park it on the road well you park it on a road that you're trying to plow with a grader you know <laughs> so it, it is a, a big well, issue but and other points uh, along those lines and, and to your point um you know i i'm aware of a specific instance in the um uh, cascade area big house owned by our uh, army lieutenant colonel he is not there <clears throat> he's running out into big groups because that's how he makes and he makes a lot of money with it and these big groups then park all over the place and they actually now uh, produce safety hazards uh, where you can't get a fire truck down a street because all of these uh, vehicles are parked. You can, you, can, you can also have these conversations about noise ordinances, but a lot of noise ordinances are not enforceable. Basically, they're not enforceable in Colorado. So it comes down to there are some basic things that we can try to force, but I think we're going to be fumbling around and searching and hunting and and not getting in, into a good place until we define what's commercial versus private action. Yeah, in El Paso County, with a large group, we have been, we're consistently bringing large groups in that, to me, under our land use codes, that would be an event. 
Yeah, they, 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 well, it's like uh, there would be a ten in line for a family to have a family reunion, and then there's ten cars there. And that's what it is. Yeah. We don't have the information. There are some appellate court decisions that are either in the process or been delivered. Um, don't know that it's Colorado. I don't have my notes in front of me, but that are defining that. And from what I can understand, it has not been defined as a commercial use. So, and, and so I wish I had more on that. I didn't know we'd get into this conversation, but so there's there's that too. And I, I think that we're going to be, we have to start somewhere. And I think that we have the opportunity to refine it as we have experience with regulation um, and, and keep it. I always go back to that word balanced. Um, so that's just my two cents. And that's just from having an active conversation I know those guys are waiting on us. They're putting the pressure on us to figure it out for them first. <laughs> We've got Russian in the flames. We figured we'd let you go first. <laughs> so we're, so we're one, happy to. One of the things we did in Cripple Creek, being a small town, um, rather than looking at the zoning issue, which the point of vista said we've got a motel operating in a residential area because they've turned their each room in their house into a VRBO. Um, what we did to we're, we're allowing the licensed uh, short-term rentals to remain, and we're requiring any new license to be within X number of feet of the property line of an existing short-term rental. And because we're such a small community, that controls um, how many we can get on a block. And, and it really, it's going to help us not deal with the zoning piece because our, our, it will disperse them enough that in a small community, we're, we can only grow so much. So. That may still be enforcement nightmare. Yep. We had that, and yep. we've kind of walked away from it. I think uh, I think all kinds of enforcement are going to be really, really difficult. And, and sooner or later, and, until you get this definition of commercial and private action defined, you're going to have people that are going to be defending their actions as private action, and you're doing a taking of their rights. So you, you're, we're going to continue to, until that gets defined, I think we're going to continue to find. Uh, I, I was just saying, I'm sorry to let everybody down that rabbit hole. Uh, I, I really would like to talk about our... Thank you, and I'm going to do the exact same thing. I want to say more about uh, Alma, and I want to hear more about the uh, Senior Coalition and some of the things you're doing. Do you have a uh, charts prepared, or is it a conversation? You know, we'll, we'll let Jenny go, since she's part of the first sure. Um, yeah, so if I can introduce, um, so uh, again, Jody Barker, I'm the director of the Area Agent Sound Agent. As you know, we administered the Older Americans Act and Older Coloradans Act funding into the three county region. And um, thank you, um, Commissioner Elsner, for both the kudos to PPCG. It was a very difficult time on top of the pandemic and the, the challenges that presented. Um, but we really needed to take action to make sure that the seniors of Park County um, receive the services um, that uh, that uh, that they can access. And so, um, yeah, Jenny Danner is the executive director of the Park County Senior Coalition and is uh, one of our contractors. We now have two contractors in Park County. We're really excited about that. So Jenny will share more about her programs here in um, with the Park County Senior Coalition. And then on, on Zoom, we have Betsy Hayes, who is the Director of Resource Development with Mount Evans Home Health Care and Hospice. And they are one of our newest providers into Park County. And we'll let uh, Betsy put their services uh, in her own words. But we'll start with Jenny here in the room and then a couple minutes with Betsy and you can see what's going on around uh, aging services. Outstanding, please. Thank you all for letting me be here today. I have certainly learned a lot already. Um, I'm Jenny Danner, the director of the Park County Senior Coalition. We are a nonprofit organization, and like Jody Barker said, a provider of the Area Agency on Aging. Um, we work to keep seniors safely in their mountain homes, and that is our main goal. We provide several programs to do so. We provide programs around food, transportation, shore, homemaker, reassurance, and we also do case management as well. Um, this past fiscal year, I'd like to share that we have had tremendous success. We've provided over 2,000 medical and grocery trips reimbursed. We've distributed 5,000 pantry and frozen meals. 
We've conducted 220 hours of case management and supported 314 hours of homemaking, which is similar to light house cleaning. Um, and we finance 138 mountain chores. So these are things like firewood, snow removal, things that contribute to the safety of a senior's home and keeping them in their home. The total amount served was 742. So we are very excited about this because we provided four times more programs this year than we did the previous year. And we served almost double the amount of total clients served. Uh, this shows that we're reaching more seniors, that you know we're working very hard, but it also shows that there is a very large need here. And especially coming out of the pandemic, especially as our aging population continues to grow every single year, um, we're going to continue to see that increase and we need to be able to match that, um, that need. So we do serve the entirety of Park County. We serve about 40% of the Fair Play Alma, Hartzell, Como Jefferson area, and then about 40% in the Grand Shawnee, Bailey, Pine Junction area, and then about 20% in Guffey, like George Southern Park County area. Um, so as you all experienced today driving here, all of these communities are extremely far apart. They're very spread out. Um, so we, we do serve all of those communities. And actually, I would like to highlight a project that we did to try to tackle this geographic issue. Um, we worked closely with the AAA and Park County government, and what we did is we created a food accessibility project, and this project um, used CARES Act funding, and we utilized Park County government community centers that are in each main community throughout Park County, and what we did is put freezers, stock the frozen meals for our clients in each of these main communities so that our clients are able to access food where they live. And so this is really important with road closures and the mountain weather we experience here and lack of transportation options for those clients to be able to have food um, exactly in their own home area. Um, so we serve about, oh, so in total, there's probably 25% of the residents or more in Park County that are 60 years and older. And so as this continues to increase, we're gonna continue to work closely with other organizations and the AAA um, and the town. We're also heavily involved in the transit study that's happening so that we can continue to meet that need that's growing every single year. So that's all I have for my update. Thank you again for letting me be here and share and please feel free to ask any questions. Just uh, one quick question for me. Um, what the governance for the coalition, are you a 501c3? Yes. 501c3? Yep. Okay, great. And uh, so you've got a board. We do. We have six board members and we have representation from each main community in the board. And then we also have um, the director of Park County's Department of Human Services on our board, Susan Walton, who's been a great attribute to our board. And do you, uh, uh, you, you obviously work through pu with public agencies that are providing resources or some funding and so forth, but do you also uh, pursue private funding? We do, yes. Okay. We seek every option for funding that we can get. <laughs> I'll tell you why I bring that up, and I'll just I'll just finish with this. I think that that's a model that works in the Colorado Springs, El Paso County area. These uh, private nonprofits, but also sometimes for profits, that uh, can work in the private space, but then also interact with the public space, and uh, have to, uh, in order to do everything they have an interest in doing, they've got to be. Uh, uh, delivering outcomes uh, that uh, meet the interests of both of these environments. And I, I think that that's a model that just really, really works. It works well for us. It sounds like it's working here. It seems to be something that happens a lot. And I just appreciate that it's coming out that way also up here in Burke County. Yeah, and it, it works really well. And to give you just a, a quick, you know, how, how big Burke County is, um, it takes me my end of Park County, an hour and 45 minutes to drive to Guffey, which is on the southern end of Park County. And that's what they're confronted with is uh, the, the distances to get around this county uh, are tremendous. And to be able to have something in Guffey that they can get their food, uh, you know, and, and have it all around, I think was just, when they came up with that idea, it was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and, uh, square miles of 
Oh, we're 2,200 square miles. We do, yeah. We're very close to you. We're just a little bit less. Yeah, but but you don't have Red Hill, <laughs> yeah, Kenosha. <laughs> no, you don't have any of that. You know, I, I've been to I've been to Eastern El Paso, Canada. <laughs> And it looks very urban and it's very strange. If you had your hand raised, then I think you should still have your hand. Can you just talk about uh, what you uh, attribute such an increase in services over a year? Or why? Absolutely. So we have really dedicated our time towards programs, following through, and outreach. So we are definitely trying to reach more isolated seniors. And we're also making sure that we serve every community throughout Park County. That was something we had heard um, was an issue with the organization before, was that we were only serving the Fair Play area. And um, that 40% Bailey, 40% Fair Play really has grown tremendously. That statistic has doubled for Bailey as well, that we are truly serving um, that side of the pass. And then also Southern Park County, we're really trying to do outreach there in Lake George and Guffey and increase that 20%. So it's served. really more about your outreach, not about influx of- uh, It's right. definitely full. Well, yeah, you, you look at it, um, 60, 62% of the people that live in Park County live on the other side of Kenosha Pass. And that was a group that really wasn't getting any service. Uh, once uh, it got there, it's like, we're going to move in that direction. So, uh, you know, any, you're going to have a lot of growth when you have 60% of the people aren't getting any service and suddenly they get service. And it's the same thing. You know, Guffey's a pretty good sized community. You drive around there, you think, oh, there's nobody here. But it's a pretty good sized community down in Guffey. And the same thing with Lake George. Um, so it's reaching out yeah. and the work that they have done to actually get out and get people involved, uh, which is, I think, the, the tremendous help that we have. Yeah. Because we do have a, a lot of seniors and, you know, people that are seniors in Park County have a tendency to be very independent thinking. Um, and it's like, I, you know, and it's like, we're here to help, let us know. And then, you know, to, get, to keep making outreach, our veterans people, it's the same thing, getting a hold of the veteran and just saying, hey, if you need help, give me a call. We're here to help you, but we're not going to get in your face. But that's, that is helping quite a little bit. I mean, to show you how independent we are, we had one gentleman four, five years ago who was building a house. And he didn't have enough money to build the house or put in the septic. So he was digging the septic system himself. And he's 72 years old. And he was making really good progress. <laughs> but the county stepped in. Uh, someone said, hey, this guy really needs help. The county stepped in and, and we made a deal with him to where, okay, we'll put in your septic. We'll do these things to build your house. This is what it's going to cost. We want to put that lien against your property. So when you sell your property, we can recover some of our costs back. But other than that, the county helped to get into its house. So those are the, the things that, that we try to do. And the senior coalition is just spectacular in starting to get to reach out. Because the biggest thing, especially going into the holidays, is a contact. You know, we've got a couple other organizations that try to contact seniors just to have that. We know you're there, you're here, you got anything, you know, the sheriff's department is working with us on making calls, you know, as we get closer to Christmas, uh, just wellness check with a gift card, box candy, that type of thing. Yeah, just a, a question for you on, I know with a Teller Senior Coalition that, you know, they service down into Ute Pass, into El Paso County, Green Mountain Falls, Trapeda Park. And they also, I know they're provide a lot of service to Eastern Park County, Lake George, Guffey, et cetera. Um, is, uh, how do you feel like the, the cooperation is there? Is it, a, is it cooperative? And, you know, and, and if not, how can, you know, how can we help to ensure? Because obviously from Teller Senior Coalition being located uh, out of Divide is only 15 miles from Lake George versus, you know, 50 miles from here, right? Yes. Um, so it, is, is that working well or could it work better? Uh, you know, I guess, how, how can we help? 
I would say it's working very well. I work closely with Kathy Lowry. She is absolutely fantastic from the Teller Senior Coalition. And we really appreciate that fact that we do have clients that live in Park County, but they're technically, they could be four miles from Teller. And so to be able to utilize those services um, that are close to their home, and especially your transportation services are amazing. So we are working together and seeing how we can partner, how we can make the resources we do have go further, and ideas with possible transit routes and connecting with the teller routes that are already existing there. So I think just continuing to work together and try to, um, that tri-county draft was just completed um, for transportation, looking at connecting these three regions um, so that people can get where they need to go, especially if they're going to Colorado Springs for doctors and nurses. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I think the collaboration um, has just blossomed and ex truly exploded uh, because like George is somewhat split and so close in so many ways to the Teller County, uh, the partnership between Jenny and, and Kathy between the two coalitions has just been fantastic in the way that we can continue to serve and meet those needs. Um, and a couple of things I wanna highlight is uh, not just the outreach, but she has gained so many more volunteers as part of that outreach that it's not Jenny or someone here in, from the office going out to that freezer in Guffey or Lake George to distribute that meal. She has um, local and truly local close by volunteers who help serve that project. So it's not a, a project of one, it's a project of many that's making this work to make sure that our older population are served. It's really exciting in that way. Those of you who are on the bus, when you go through uh, Lake George, look on your left, a big, a big yellow building, the Lake George Community Center, that's where one of the freezers are. Um, it's, and it's really just a, a brilliant concept that is actually being recognized by our state unit on aging at CDHS right now as a, as a, as a truly meeting the need um, based on the challenges of the environment. And it came up again in a meeting just last week uh, here, the freezer project, as it's come to be known. And I said, it's it's a collaboration between county and service provider and volunteers. And so it's just really exciting to see what where Park County Senior Coalition was and where they are today and the services that they're providing. I would also um, just, if I may, just explain a little bit, some of the services, uh, because of the challenges of access to services, transportation and some others, uh, the homemaking uh, services, those are really a client directed and what we consider a neighbor to neighbor service. So an individual who has the need can choose someone to do that work or to provide that ride and then get reimbursed for it. Because as uh, Commissioner Elster, so you know, they're, the, the transportation is challenging here. And so um, many of, much of our funding actually goes into what's known as a voucher program. And it allows the senior, the, the older adult to make arrangements and to then um, reimburse the individual who's providing that direct service. So it's a really win-win uh, situation across the across the county. Yes, please. I'm not a board member, but um, I, I have the South House of the County as my district. And looking at ways that we can use the, the neighbor transportation voucher component to link up to transportation from Teller to go farther into services within either Woodland Park or Colorado Springs is some things that we've brainstormed. And so, you know, it's easy to be able to pick up your neighbor and get them to a bus stop, make sure they're on safely so that they can go their way and then arrange that pickup again. And so that's some of the, the brainstorming we've done to get these more rural area services. So it's, it's working. All right, if no other questions, uh, any other questions? Yeah, I'm, sorry, go, I'm, go I'm happy to introduce Betsy. Uh, Betsy Hayes, if you are ready. There we go. So Betsy Hayes, like I mentioned before, she's the Director of Resource Development with Mount Evans Home Health Care uh, and Hospice, uh, one of our newest providers into the Air Agency on Aging System. So uh, Betsy, would you share a little bit about your services and how you're going to, what you're, who you're going to be serving? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Um, the county is huge. And we are in the healthcare space and we're on the other side of the pass, as 
I almost piped in earlier when you were talking about Bailey and the Platte County um, Chamber of Commerce, because we are in that space. So what we do is um, we are Mount Evans Home Healthcare and Hospice. And for over 40 years, we provide all of the in-home professional health care for residents across a four county area. So we uh, serve Clear Creek, Gilpin, Jefferson, and Park. But we just serve that little slice of park that is on 285 um, going out towards uh, Shawnee. So that's where we are. And our nurses and physical therapists and occupational therapists, social workers go into the homes of people who are recovering from a serious illness. Um, maybe they are um, have wound care that needs to be happening. Um, we've got hospice care. We have free grief services. So that's what we do. Um, and so they drive all over and with four counties. Last year it was 350,000 miles um, that were driven by our clinicians delivering 26,000 patient visits. And we are a nonprofit, 501c3. We are, our services are funded by Medicare, Medicaid, traditional insurance, and then my job of the fundraising. Um, how we got involved with PPACG um, is because of Dr. Cog, actually. Um, we get a grant from Dr. Cog for the last bunch of years and for senior services, counseling, that sort of things. And we also are running free foot clinics in the communities in which we serve. And so these are held at like a community center or a senior center, something like that. And it gives our professional clinicians a chance to get eyes on seniors um, because they're rural. I mean, they live 20, 40 minutes off a highway on a dirt road. You know, they don't get out much. You know, they do have food insecurities. They do have um, housing challenges. You know, they have all those things going on in their life. And so what we do is we are providing um, free foot clinics in the communities. So the seniors will come and um, we work with the senior centers to try to figure out the transportation challenges. But we bring them in and our team, they get right down there and they, you know, check their feet. They're giving them free pedicures, taking care of them. They get uh, free blood pressure checks. It just gives us a chance to see them and then also to let them know, like, here's the type of services. Oh, no. Did I lose? Oh, phew. Our, it's really windy here today. Um, mm -hmm. I'm in Evergreen and we're losing Internet half back and forth. Um, but uh, I just wanted to let you know that what um, we've been doing these foot clinics and we were doing them in Conifer on 285. And we had people that were driving from Bailey over to Conifer. Um, and Dr. Cog was willing to pay when it was just one or two, um, but then it became more people. And so then what we did is Dr. Cog said, we're not gonna pay for that anymore, but you should reach out to PPACG. And so that's what we just did in this last year um, because we had run a couple of foot clinics in Bailey at our own expense and it gets expensive, we're a nonprofit. Um, and so you all were generous enough to give us a grant to get those up and running. And so that's what we're working on. And, um, you know, the goal is to try to have one about every other month and see how it's going, see, you know, what the volume is and that sort of thing. But this way people can be, um, our staff gets paid and they're professionals so they can really see what do these seniors need and they can drive from wherever. And if they drive up and over the pass, of course, we would still serve them um, because it's Park County, but we really are kind of targeting that little pocket you mentioned earlier that is on the other side of the pass and doesn't have a mountain of services. We want to make sure they know that we're there. So if somebody's having an end of life situation or, you know, needs home health care, they know that, you know, Mount Evans Home Health Care and Hospice is there to reach out. Thank you so much, Betsy. So are there any questions about what we're doing or? Well, I, I don't know who, who might be the right person to answer, but just dawned on me, uh, is there an assisted living center? No. No, no, no. No. No, and that's what makes it really challenging. I mean, yeah. you know, we have a four county area with really barely any assisted living. Um, so our 
team is totally used to driving 40 minutes to go to someone's home and help them. And it's not just a five minute appointment. They sit down, they talk to them, you know, if they're taking meds, do you understand why you're taking these meds? Let's make sure that this is the right thing. If they need physical therapy, because they broke a hip and they live alone in Bailey, you know, we have people like that. They cannot drive. So our team goes to them to help them get back on their feet and up and running. Yes, Pat. So I've got a question and it, 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 it's, it goes back to last year's homestead property tax um, mm -hmm. initiative that was going on for seniors. Yep. Are you, are you guys hearing that some of these seniors are at risk of losing housing because their property taxes have now gone beyond their ability to pay? I now haven't heard, I haven't heard that yet, but um, you know, for, like I said before, you know, I mean, we've been talking about, uh, or all of you have been talking about, you know, the housing challenges that are being faced and, you know, food insecurities. From the healthcare perspective, um, my job is fundraising and grants, individual donations. Um, we serve people regardless of the ability to pay. So if they cannot afford our services, we don't say no, we still go. And the work that I do covers the, the staff expense for that. So I don't know about the the taxes and things like that, but they would still get served in the healthcare space. Yes, uh, Council Member Avila. Have you gone to homes where the seniors have passed? Cats? Like cats. Passed cats? Away. Passed away. Died. Uh, passed away, yes. Oh, passed. Oh, yes. Yes, because I mean, we do our... Um, so that you're, you're kind of surprised. You get there and then you find that they passed. Uh, Yes, that has happened to us. Um, we might get a phone call from a neighbor. Um, you know, usually what happens if a neighbor finds somebody who has passed away, they call the police. Um, if it's one of our patients and there's information, we also get a call. If, you know, we do a lot of hospice care, end of life, helping both the patient who is about to pass as well as any family or relatives. Um, handle that journey. So we know kind of what's happening in the house. You know, we go, our team goes and pronounces if somebody is, has passed away that's in our care. Um, but we do get caught. I mean, they don't need our care if they're already gone, not to be, you know, totally blunt about it, but, um, you know, we do what we can to help the families if that person is already gone. So we have free grief counseling. You can do remote grief counseling. You don't have to drive all the way to our office, which is in Evergreen. Um, you know, we have services that are, you know, telehealth kinds of things if you can't get in for group, but that's all free. That's all supported by fundraising or the hospice benefit under Medicaid. And, and a question for me, uh, and it, I, I can speak to this from personal experience about uh, my mom recently in the last year going into assisted living and how important it was for the family to be part of Right. Convincing her to do that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that you can maybe provide some insights that in a lot of these uh, uh, clients that you have, really for any of you, that you've got family engagement as well. Because, Absolutely. Yeah, I, that's like so important because these these folks, as, as independent as they may be, they eventually are going to get to a place where it doesn't make any difference. They're they just can't be mm -hmm. there anymore. And they really need to either move in with a family member where they can get more right. continuous care or go to assisted living where they can get 24 seven care. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I think the, the way to do that is having family engagement. So that's the question, family engagement. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And you know, we go to people no matter where their home is. So if there is an assisted living, and they need our services, like you were saying, you know, like an end of life type of thing. Um, you know, we would come in. I mean, that just means that there's nothing else that can be done from a medical perspective. And it doesn't mean you're going to pass tomorrow. You could pass in 24, 48 hours, six months, two years. You know, average length of stay in a hospice program um, is more like around, you know, 60 to 80 days. And those people could be in their home or they could be in an assisted living. And then we are going in and our social workers are going in, working with the families. Um, you know, if you have 
a neighbor, because a lot of these people live alone, as we've discussed, you know, if a neighbor is in there kind of as a caregiver, we're working with them as well. Because like I said before, this journey is not just about a person who there is nothing else medically can be done. This journey is about everyone else being able to figure out how do you have that in perspective? How do you support the one that's going and then support each other that go on? Yeah. So, right. yeah, it, it's uh, other questions. Other questions. And, uh, uh, okay, there's a, we've got the list of everybody online as well. It's also uh, open for anybody online if you have questions. Okay, well, thank you. What else do we have on the presentation? Thank you. Um, fair play. Fair play. <laughs> yeah. um, so just to add a few things about short-term rental um, that maybe you haven't seen elsewhere that we hope that we are setting the bar with is we adopted ours May 1st. Well, actually, it went into effect May 1st. We did set a cap based upon our available housing units here. And so um, we are very strict in our guidelines. We require a site plan, a detailed site plan that they have to set forth where their trash pickup is, um, where their parking is, if they have a fire feature, just all kinds of things. Um, if they we require annual inspections for anything that is like a fireplace or that natural gas of some type of thing, just a safety of the community. Um, we also worked with our fire protection district and they require an annual inspection by the fire protection district to sign off on. Um, we, uh, one of our last things that we also do is our building official, we're a small community, so we're allowed, we're able to do this. Um, our building official goes in and conducts an inspection too to verify that the site plan is accurate and to talk with them about like parking, making sure the parking is all contained on site. Um, we also require um, an additional contact that has to be available within one hour of any issue. And so um, we also post on our website those units that are licensed with the license number and the owner and their phone number. <laughs> and it's like, if you have an issue, you're coming back before our board and you may have your permit revoked. And, um, you know, we're we just like said, started this in May. Um, we allowed one per person or entity. And then I think the last thing would be to encourage your staff to think outside the box. Um, we are also hopeful that as part of our land use processes that um, we will encourage our developers to dedicate deed restricted units. We have put in that if they will during um, zoning or subdivision or PV, if they will dedicate a deed restricted affordable unit, we will provide for an additional short term rental in that subdivision. So um, hopefully help them sell a unit, but then, then also keep a teacher or a fireman or someone to be able to afford a house here. Um, I think the other thing um, I was gonna say, and, and I'll send this all to Andy, but I said, encourage your staff to think outside the box. How can you incentivize um, your developers to, to provide those as well? So um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> We, uh, we thought we would have an issue. We only allowed 20, and I still have only issued 15. Um, I have a couple in process, and we're just beginning our renewal process. But ours is 300 no matter what, and it's renewable annually. And if you miss a deadline, too bad. You don't get your permit. And we don't have any waiting list. And we were just like, let's try to keep it simple and straightforward and uh, there will be penalties if you have issues. So um, we were hoping with the website, you know, at least neighbors can say, this is where our unit is at. And when they see cars that are out of state, they're contacting us saying, hey, um, we've noticed there's additional, uh, you know, activity over here, that type of thing. So we really tried to focus on protecting our community with our regulations. And so we'll see how it, it all goes, I suppose process. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, so you sort of addressed the city, you're funding through a $300 a year increase, is that how you're funding it? 
and and uh, catching scoff laws just uh, people looking at what's happening around them. Is that how you? So far, he did have this. So he started with our uh, the ones that were already licensed, so he, they were like, yeah. I think for us, we're a small enough community that everybody knows everybody. When they see, when they know that a property changes hands, they know, um, you know, if there's all these other out of town yeah. cars, they're going to say, hey, notice this. And so, but we do a lot of driving around. We have an active mayor who drives like the town every day. So <laughs> mayor is code enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, myself, I drive the streets a lot looking at things, and so, um, yeah, we're just, I think the more local control you can put in place and those, you know, um, protections for your community and give yourself that ability to revoke those licenses. So, um, so let's see, other things going on here. Um, transit, uh, we are accepting two transit buses from the city of Cooper Creek. And the um, Coop Creek Care Center, which went out of business, so we will be implementing a transit program here in Fair Play. So that's why I'm excited about this study and working with the county and Alma, some of the other communities. Um, hopefully, looking forward to applying for an innovative mobility grant to help fund part of that since I missed the super call. Um, we are in process of uh, updating our unified development code. Our processes are outdated, contradictory. Of course, we're also working on building in some stuff for affordable and workforce housing. Um, as far as workforce housing, we're looking forward to partnering with the county who's looking at building a project here in town. Um, we were notified by the Department of Transportation that they have full funding to build a workforce housing project here in town. And so we'll be looking forward to, uh, it's currently out for uh, RFP. And so we hope that that will be uh, coming out of the ground. So um, it does create some other things, issues for rehoming our summit stage, but I think there's a lot of um, potential to work together with them to, uh, with CDOT on, you know, uh, housing bills, but also working with our, our school district potentially to, to help them, it's right across the street um, from the school to maybe do some work at the school site to build um, a program for mechanics and having them come in and teach um, things about you know working for CDOT. So we're hoping that it will, like I said, have some ancillary effects if we can get this all done. Um, we're also working with CDOT on our MMOF River Park grant. Um, we did get our IGA signed. We're on to the next step. And so excited about that. Thank you all for, for that money. Um, I think Commissioner Ellsner touched on this, water, big deal. So uh, when I interviewed here, that was my first question. What is the build out of this community based on water? And they're like, oh, we're fine. It's like, mm -hmm. get hired. You're like, oh, okay, we're not fine. We're already at capacity. The one thing that we do have going here is that there was an infiltration gallery built like 25 years ago and it was never put online. And the contractor ran away with the plans. And so um, before I did get here, they did contract. So we've got an engineer um, that has been able to get it working. And so we are working with um, state and the SRF to get a grant to um, bring that online and permit it, which will double our capacity, but we've got a lot of projects coming forward. So we're gonna have to look at the potential of even another water plant here. And of course we're divided by the river. So we need infrastructure on the other side. So um, it's it's just, it's been very interesting and eye-opening, but we're, we're working because this is the county seat. This houses all the state, federal and local government offices and all the services. So. It's exciting times, there's a lot going on. Um, another thing is that we purchased, the, the town purchased the uh, 501 main building from the county when they vacated it and moved into this nice facility. And so we are working to uh, rehabilitate that to become a community-wide building. Uh, we're hoping it will house our Chamber of Commerce. Um, we're also, again, working with our school district to maybe offer some other um, educational opportunities there like um, uh, cooking classes, but it would also extend to the community, not just the school, but 
um, cosmetology, maybe some college classes. Our food bank operates out of there. So um, it's a great facility, but it's going to take a lot of money to bring it up to code. And so, so if I might just uh, ask a quick question, it was sure. kind of quickly back to water. Do you have a lot of water available, but it's not an availability issue? It's about infrastructure. It's to infrastructure. Get yeah, we actually, the AAA is very, very lucky. We have some of the oldest rights in the state. Okay. And so, yeah, we're, we're lucky with that. And um, and then the uh, the infrastructure that you do have, that's public infrastructure yes. that you're talking about? Okay. Yeah, the town, has, uh, we own the water, um, and we actually took on the sewer district years ago. It was a special district. So you have we water. Also, yeah. So our sewer district extends outside the town's limits into part of the county. So we have to we provide sewer to parts of the county just outside. You have private providers for electricity. We have Excel for electricity okay. and it's, natural gas. And yeah, electricity in Park County is is a challenge. <laughs> it's kind of because it's oh well, this is Excel. Well, across the street is IREA or Core. Yeah. You know, so it, it it is really interesting up here. Uh, I mean, a little south of the town is core, and this is Excel, and it, it's kind of like phone service too. It's in, in the internet up here. It's it, a patchwork at best. Um, I think that one of our other projects for 2023 is uh, getting broadband to our town. The town would like to be able to provide that. Um, so we do have a, the county does have a broadband committee and we'll work with them. Um, let's see, on 2023, I hope to um, get our board, we have one opening and we should be um, appointing an additional member and hopefully it will be stable for a couple of years. So in 2023, get some more representation from their play on the board and uh, get them at the meetings more regularly. Um, and then I think the last thing I was going to mention is that our big CDOT 285-9 project is out to bid, and hopefully that is going to be awarded December 1st after they were able to get some additional funds. Um, so we have no idea what that's going to look like, but um, just real quickly, hopefully we can get some better communication about the project. And um, yeah, because like having this happen today and we didn't even know about it at the town level until somebody else said, oh, did you see the sign outside of town? And we were like, okay. And so with that project, it's gonna to need to be statewide notifications because it's gonna impact a major route to the front range and to the Western Slope. And then um, just last thing I was just gonna say, uh, well, of course we're looking forward to partnering with the county, with Alma, um, and with PPACG and other entities on a lot of projects, but, also, thank you to the PPACG board and the other member entities for allowing Andy and staff to provide some more focus on this side of the mountain. And we're excited about all the opportunities. We're excited to be able to help wherever we can. So yeah. just let us know. Yes. Yeah. Unless you have any other questions. Well, I just wondered if I heard a request to see that again there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we will work with, with communication on the project. I was going to talk about, you know, that particular project. And, so I got and I have the direct number to our, our resident engineer, and he's been very good. And as soon as it gets spit out, we'll have a big community meeting again to bring whoever the contractor is in and see that. So we can talk about all of that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions then uh, for uh, and uh, do we have it, uh, anybody here for uh, Alma? I don't believe we do. No. Uh, we're, we'll need to work. I think that retail manager, I believe, yes, they do. He did get his or her contact info and get them a little more connected. And we do some outreach with them. Are they, are they winning the battle on who's the highest altitude incorporated town? <laughs> they <United> are. <laughs> they okay. are the highest. Um, and if Leadville does something stupid and tries to annex something higher. <laughs> um, I think the county is more than willing to allow all oh, to right. annex some of the county. Because of oh, the oh, oh, annexation to the top of a 14er. Right. Or something. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, Dick, do you have anything else? Well, well I was just going to say, you know, Fairplay has got a lot going on. Come up here during the summer. 
Um, you know, borough days is, is a huge thing. It is a lot of fun. Um, it does have a, a race that used to be from Fair Play to Leadville, but Leadville got into an argument on Fair Play. And so it's up to the top of the pass and back down. It's uh, uh, referred to as get your ass up the pass. Uh, so you get your borough up the pass. It's a lot of fun to watch. We I think have llama races. Uh, I, I know pre-pandemic, we were getting really, really good at uh, outhouse races. Um, so I know there's a lot of fun things that go on in fair play and of course our fair. Uh, there's, we're doing a lot of really neat things here. Great. I'll just open it up. Uh, anybody else have any questions for any of our hosts and uh, municipalities that are up here? Well, I, yeah, I have please. a question. You know, your area is spread out kind of like Alaska is. And I came out of the Federal Aviation Administration. Are you kind of looking at maybe some of the things that Alaska may be trying to do to try to service their um, residents up there? Because I know they're really heavily dependent on air. Um, but you know, we've got the advent of a lot of these drones coming in. And granted, most people think the drones are small, but there's a big ones the size of a predator. It's basically the size of an airplane. And so I, was, I didn't know if you were maybe looking at other remote areas of the country, maybe see if there's something that you could glean from that. Great idea. We'll look at that's pretty ambitious for our budget, but we'll, we'll look if, uh, if the military is selling any used drones. I mean, be more certified predator. Right. Well, and, and to be fair to that, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, aviation is not an inexpensive approach. However, you know, there's like Cessna 152s with uh, big gigantic balloon tires that can land on almost anything. And it might be an interesting approach to service delivery. It is expensive, but you can cover a really wide area knowing, in a really short time. Knowing some of the people in Park County, I do not want to fly a yeah. plane low and land in the field. It's it is a dangerous thing to do because <laughs> it looks like a target. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I'll I'll bring this up. We've been approached by a, a an out of state business to bring an electric um, aircraft in that can carry six passengers and it can land vertically. So it, it requires just a path rather than a you know, road. So they are looking at potentially based. It is commercially operating in other parts of this country. I'm sure you've heard of it, but um, they are looking at operating out of the springs. But that would be beneficial to rural communities. So this turned out not to be a trivial conversation about yeah. aviation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think El Paso County, the uh, people around me be getting shotguns out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> not, sure. We, we help send people out the deer trail. Please don't shoot at the aircraft. Yeah. I know your fields. You do not own the airspace. <laughs> they have they been looking for that certain number of back from aircrafts. Mm -hmm. you know, there was a, a, a time when the legislature was looking at um, enabling the search and rescue to use drones and, and all of that. And there was a bill. And, Representative Wilson, um, who was our representative at the time, was sponsoring this because it was a really, I think, a great idea. But it was someone from our county who went there and testified against it because um, she didn't want them running their drones over while she and her friends were running naked through the woods. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, that, that and that is true. It is actually in, in testimony. Not, so not. that's when you get to Park County, you have to be very careful if something is flying. I haven't been uh, too engaged in unmanned aircraft, but uh, prior to running for office, I founded UAS Colorado, the business league for unmanned aircraft in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So I'm the founding CEO of that uh, business league, which has 500 members based out of Denver, and they're very, very active. Great. Well, okay, there's an aviation discussion in there. Yeah, right. um, so I guess we can uh, maybe conclude with that. I just would like to seriously thank first of all you hosting us here I, I i think i can probably speak for the other board members i learned a lot 
about what's going on in Fair Play and in Park County. That's kind of the point, frankly, but it was also really just interesting to, to really listen to some of the challenges you have, some of which are common to what the rest of PPACG has and others which are, you know, you have your own unique issues as well. So those are really cool. So um, I think it's great that we came up here and listened to some of this. Yeah. Uh, are there any other comments anybody would like to make on the board before we move to the next topic? Yes, oh, oh uh, uh, well, go ahead, Andy. Hey, just make sure you weren't going to adjourn because we did have to have uh, some CDOT. Uh, yes, yes, we're not adjourning yet. Yeah, yeah, we've got more on the agenda. That, that is correct. Thank you. Okay, very good. So I, I think we can. Uh, that was a uh, 7C. So um, let's continue through the agenda 8A through 8G. No presentations, uh, uh, and there are notes about those things. Let's go to the CDOT monthly update. Yeah, so in the interest of time, you know, we were going to talk about some projects and stuff. You know, one of them mentioned for this particular area is the Highway 9 285 uh, intersection project, which is right outdoors. It has been advertised. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to award it this time, if you recall. You know, we came to, to you guys in order to supplement the budget um, within the within the TIP uh, earlier this year in order to get that awarded because we weren't able to award it last year. Similarly, uh, our overlay project uh, through Woodland Park um, and up towards Divide, uh, that was advertised. Um, we advertised it with two uh, bid schedules, you know, with a shorter limit and also a longer limit, depending upon pricing that we saw. Um, it looks like we're going to be able to award the shorter limit. Uh, we are. Uh, we did see some pretty high prices in terms of asphalt. Even already this year, we saw $130 per ton for asphalt this year, which was uh, kind of shocking to us. Um, so we are going to have to supplement the budget a little bit, but we are planning on awarding the, the shorter limits for that particular project. And I guess I would just say if there's any specific project questions, maybe we'll open it up right now before I make some additional comments. What would, that shorter, shorter limit Dan? Like? what would that shorter limit look like? Uh, I'm sorry? What would the shorter the limit look like on the overlay? Uh, do you remember what that looks like? It should be a uh, mark post. Uh, 31, which is about a mile west of Edlow Road. Okay, so yeah, that's the limit. Uh, so it'll go through Woodland Park, you know. Um, instead of going all the way to Divide, it'll stop yes, at Blue Bird Hill. Yep. Okay, any other uh, questions uh, on project related stuff? And I have a couple other announcements. And just checking to make sure that we have any comments or questions for anybody online. No one has indicated unless anyone in the conference room has anything, but okay. Uh, if, if you do and you're online, just feel free to chime in because it's a little hard to see. Uh, but uh, but please just chime in if you have a question. Okay, I'd say go ahead and proceed with the rest. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just, you know, from a larger statewide perspective, um, you know, we, we are working on our FY24 budget right now. There's going to be some presentations uh, to the Transportation Commission next week. Um, and so we'll have a better idea of what that really looks like and, and what we're looking towards. Um, similarly, another thing that was mentioned here today of interest in the local community is, you know, in terms of recruitment and retention, particularly for our, our maintenance forces in this part of the state um, and other, you know, hard to fill locations within the state, you know, like the Vale, um, Silverthorne areas, uh, we are looking at opportunities for employment and housing. And so we are looking very closely with the county and, and the town um, on, on actually procuring some uh, employee housing for here to help us with recruitment and retention, just given there's no availability. So a lot of parts of the state, we have housing stipends to help people with cost. When you can't find a place to live, period, um, that presents another challenge in and of itself. So you know, that's something we're working on. Hopefully we'll have something in place by next winter, uh, actually here in Fair Play, actually constructed soon. Um, and I think the, the final thing I will mention, um, and I think most of you have heard this, but maybe not, um, I'm going to be retiring from CDOT at the end of this month on November 30th. Um, and going into the private sector. Um, and so CDOT is working on, uh, you know, developing the announcement, advertising my position. Uh, they're anticipating trying to get it filled sooner rather than later, but this will be my final meeting with PPACG. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with all of you um, and all of our planning partners. It's, it's been a great run and I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for all you do. Wow, so, thank you. Uh, I, I was gonna say, and we are not gonna accept his retirement. <laughs> I'll second it. I'll not second it. So I hear a motion. <laughs> Should we do a ceremonial vote anyway? <laughs> All in the neighbors say aye. Aye. Any of those. You're not allowed to retire. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm sorry to see you go, but I hope it's on the bigger and greater things. Yeah, I'll be going into the private sector and uh, you know, working engineering consulting side of stuff. So, yeah. 
Yeah, looking forward to it. That's that's great. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, I didn't know myself. So thank you. And uh, you know, I, I'll just say on behalf of the board of PPACG and PPACG at large, thank you for the great service that you've been providing uh, to our region. We do deeply appreciate it. And uh, I know many of us know what a great relationship we have with CDOT. And that's no, that's that's due uh, in, a, in a large part to the people and the relationships that we've built. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Very good. Anything else then on CDOT update? Oh, okay. How about staff? Okay. Yes, please. I don't know if this is directed to you or somebody else. So this whole civil rights survey and the use of the whatever tracker and stuff. So what is the purpose of that? We keep getting the email I responded. Is are we going to be able to have access to use that program as a small community? Are we going to have to still buy that to use during our MMOF? Okay. So I'm not familiar with the survey that's gone out. So it sounds like it's related to LCP tracker. Yeah, yeah. And I can find out from Marsha Nelson and, and maybe our civil rights staff. Yeah, so I think that is a gift. Yeah, I'm stupid things. And I'm like, if, if we have to use it, it'd be better to know sooner rather than later. And, and I'll reach out to our local uh, uh, contact and see out that I'm working with. But it was just mentioned. And then I said, we just got our survey back. Or I responded, but we keep getting notifications. I'm like, we have to use this. I would like to know now and, and get it in place as soon as possible. Okay, yeah, I can try to you know, find answers to you. Provided that access or use, or at, or we have to go out and secure it in our own training or whatever. Okay, I appreciate you're asking the questions. The whole point of the meeting, right? Mm -hmm. to, to get those kinds of questions out so we can get to answers and so forth. Great, thank you very much. Okay, to the stack update. Uh, who do we have that can provide that? Mr. Mr. Chair, yes. I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, Holly texted me and said, Can I cover it? Um, Commissioner Elster was there, so you correct me if I'm wrong. It was the calm before the storm, right? So it was a very pedestrian uh, meeting. We talked about the budget, which Rich has already covered. They did a, a transit update where they gave the numbers for their month of free transit uh, that they, they ran, and that had a spirited discussion. And, and then finally, um, uh, the last item was uh, federal lands access program. There are monies that federal monies that come into the state to provide access to federal uh, federal uh, federal lands such as national national parks and, and whatnot. And so those monies go through a process federal lands access program uh, to be uh, dedicated. So they selected a they talked about the program. And they selected a, a new representative. Apparently the old representative. That was on. That was that yeah. happened that really, was really really on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's the staff report. Happy answering questions. So you talked about the uh, calm before the storm. What's the storm? Well, the storm is, is, is or just uh, just another joke. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I really wish it. But yeah, I was joking. But yes, this was rather pedestrian. But again, now that the elections are over, we will probably see uh, again some more. Uh, okay. Policy changes okay. or policy Thanks. shifts. Appreciate it. Yeah. That's right. No, I think you are uh, totally accurate, and it was a very awkward moment. Yeah. But um, I believe uh, Commissioner Baker um, from Chaffee County is now the representative to the federal lands um, for SNAG or whatever group he came from. But anyway, he is he's now the representative uh, to that. Um, and it is a program where if you do have federal lands, you can apply for money. Uh, they generally say it's reserved for national parks and national monuments, uh, high use areas, uh, those type of things that uh, you might need some assistance on roads to that. Yeah, when I first got here, we tried to bark up that tree to get money for uh, military installations. It didn't work. They said, you're an outsider. You came from Arizona, didn't you? They just sent me away. What about high use areas that belong to national agencies that maybe are not the right national agency on all the high use areas? What about that? Yes. So, those, those around the Pikes Peak area know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you for that update. Any questions on the staff? All right, seeing none, uh, Executive Director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of things real, real quick. Uh, this month is National Family Caregivers Month. We've had a lot of discussions around senior caregivers and the way Kent Matthews tends to split up the 
population. He's the leader of our family caregiver support center. He said the population is basically those that have been caregivers in the past, those that are currently caregivers, or those that will be caregivers in the future. It really touches all of us. I think all of us have dealt with this. We yeah, have between those three quarter categories, isn't that like everybody? That's it. That's 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 um, so it's really supported by the Caregiver Action Network. We're going to push some material out through social media. Didn't have a chance to really get it on the agenda today for a proclamation, but you'll hear more about that. We're going to send some stuff out and we'll share that with the board as well. But uh, that's uh, this month, just recognizing all of us that are deal dealing with uh, caregiver issues with our senior members of our family and in, in our neighborhoods. Um, secondly, just really want to thank Rich again uh, on behalf of us as staff. I mean, he's, he's been an amazing partner. We've gotten some really great stuff done in our region from Powers Research, the interchange there, projects in Park County and in Teller County. And um, yeah, just the, the partnership has been phenomenal. So we really, really appreciate everything Rich has done uh, with us. And we look forward to keep working together. And then just finally, thank you, Commissioner Elsner, um, for your hospitality today and making this happen. Uh, happening. Commissioner Mitchell, thank you so much. Uh, Tom and Brittany were fantastic as well, making this all happen. So we're going to do it again next year for sure. But also want to really thank Cheryl and Jared on our staff, really made this happen, uh, making sure everything was working technologically and as far as the format and all of that. So th this was great. Really appreciate your support. Well, well thank you. And I, I just want you to know your staff will not be leaving this office. We will build a place for them to live. <laughs> this, is, this is probably one of the first work sessions that we've had down here that has worked really well. Um, you know, we apologize, as I say, or as I said earlier, we ordered speakers to have everything set up. That was a month and a half ago. And then our emergency, okay, we can do this as a backup plan. That's going to arrive tomorrow. Uh, but to be fair to that point, it feels like what you put in here as a temporary fix was working just fine. It's it's PPACG that did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not taking credit for they, They're the ones. That's why they can't leave. <laughs> One other thing, though, um, the the next meeting is like the 15th of December, which um, for those of us that are members of CCI. Uh, may be a bit of an issue. Um, so it's it's something that CCI starts that afternoon. Uh, so most commissioners will be down there. I've got meetings that I have to go to in the morning. So your, your attendance may be a little sparse for, for that meeting from commissioner's standpoint, or maybe you can. Uh, it, I think perhaps uh, maybe a key part of that is um, maybe We'll hold the meeting, but if we could have a light agenda, so yeah, maybe keep it to two hours or less. Oh, for, yeah, we'll yeah. yeah, yeah, um, okay. I, I think if we just uh, have a light agenda, we can most of us will be able to get there. Okay, we'll do that. We'll mark that on the calendar, two hours or less. And uh, we might be able to have a light agenda considering we uh, passed today, but that was helpful, yeah, yeah. yeah. so. All right, anything else? Nope, that's it. All right, very good. Any member entity announcements, cool things going on, or sending anything that anybody would like to mention? Yes, please. I'd just like to say that in, in doing some um, communication with the counties, um, for wastewater treatment expansion, there's electromagnetic coagulation that is being done in Custer County. They've been working with CDPHE. They are about done on having that be an approved system. Now, it's safe. Custer County was looking at a $13 million cost to upgrade their system for only like 750, 800 people. Um, it took their cost down to 3.5 million. So it's something that is gonna be on the horizon. And I just want, since a lot of us are so, so dependent on it, that it's just something to put it on your radar. I guess please. Um, just a couple things. One, um, because uh, uh, CSU's water runs through Park and Park counties, um, you all haven't heard our uh, CEO has resigned and we're continuing the process. Yolanda and I are on board in the process of finding a replacement for him for the April municipal election so that this current board and city council will be making that decision. And uh, just on a, in my own district, um, just because we spent so much time talking about housing and seniors and so forth, uh, the senior uh, center in Colorado Springs uh, is in the process of being 
um, redesigned and repurposed and that land it's a bigger thing to talk about and I'm not going to share it now but Jody can speak to that but that is happening it's exciting and um, trying to make the most of that using smart funds as well as others and I don't know if you would add anything to that Jody but yeah it's, it's a little challenging discussion because I'm a former senior center director of that center and so I'm thrilled that there's going to be a new center uh, but also the challenges that we have um, three providers uh, that we currently fund who are in that in that in that uh, complex. The uh, uh, the overall complex, though, uh, of the city owned portion of those buildings um, will be brought down uh, starting in the spring, uh, rebuilding a new, a better, more future looking, uh, future forward um, senior center. As you know, in Colorado Springs, there is only one senior center. And that's it on North Hancock by the um, Patty Joe Golf Course. So there's a lot of excitement around that. There's also a lot of concern. Um, and so a lot of um, public meetings have been held and we're doing our, our best and um, stepping in a little bit extra. Uh, my staff and I stepping in to provide some supports to the providers who have to vacate. Um, they'll be vacating before their, um, their leases expire on March 31st because there was tentatively an April 1 groundbreaking. I don't think that's going to happen. That's been put off a little bit. Um, but we are, um, as a as an entire entity, working with all of our providers, especially those that are in the Springs area, um, really think collaboratively, you know, do you have space in your building? Do you see us... Uh, 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 an, an open uh, space on your drive to work, you know, that kind of thing, and really get the word out. Um, and so there's already been a lot of collaboration amongst the providers themselves. Uh, so more to come on that as we know more. Thank you. Okay, yes, Roland? I want to I want to tell uh, Richard, thank you very much for helping my little town. Okay, you guys really did. Thank you very much for the information you gave us. I appreciate that. But, uh, with our little town right now, uh, the people, our board, Jody's Hope and, and uh, El Paso County's uh, program called JAWS were actually impacted and gathering information to help service the elder, elderly and the home care people in my area. Talent's not the only one. We have Ramo, we have Semla, we have a whole bunch of little bitty communities come to Calhoun as a, as a focal point. And that uh, and really helped a lot in that. And, uh, you guys have actually been helped that got El Paso County involved real strongly in it too. And we're going to have a meeting coming up here next Wednesday for communication. We get everybody together. Uh, and it's it's really a, a phenomenal thing to try to get everybody together at one time. But it, it's working so great. Thank you for those. Those are great words. Yes. Uh anything else from any members? Yeah, yes, uh, Green Mountain Falls, STR stuff here in Hard Copy. If you'd like to take a look before the electronic thing comes out. Outstanding. Thank you very much. And I am interested, I can tell you that I'm I'm interested in uh getting a copy of all that stuff over to El Paso County because we're starting a conversation about it. All right, Council Member Adelaide. Thank you. Um I just wanted to thank Park County for having us here and hosting us. Uh, I, I I like coming out and seeing what's um, going on here and even the different viewpoints. But I wanted to also I'm not so much talk about SDR, but um, when we did our ordinance in 2019, my inbox was filled, all nine of us, there's nine uh, city council members, was filled with SDR and questions from both sides, uh, mostly from neighbors. And uh, I know that's kind of a little different because it's so urban in um, College Springs as opposed to out here, but I, I'm going to caution that you not get in a ideological hamster wheel because in, on our um, on our city council at that time, uh, I, I think I'm the only one here that was there that worked on the STR ordinance. Uh, the most two conservative uh, uh, city council members were Don Knight and uh, Andy Pico, and they were separate on how to. To make this ordinance either more restrictive. We ended up looking at home uh, owner occupied SDRs and non owner occupied SDRs. And we, we had a lot of restrictions with the non owner uh, SDRs. But it was um, really interesting because I was with uh, Don Knight, who very ultra conservative, and Andy was with like Richard Scorman and uh, others who. 
and we were, we, I feel like because there was a, a broad, uh, there, we had hundreds of people show up to the our, um, Regional Business Administration. Uh, we had hundreds of people come to City Hall. I mean, it was just, it was all consuming. But I think because we really worked it out, uh, we were able to pass it. And since then, I think maybe we've had two come all the way to council. Is that true? Uh, it, two, and, and really it was resolved. So I think the ordinance that we came up with has been beneficial. I don't get those in our, we don't get those in our inbox. And um, it just, I would encourage you to look at the Springs ordinance that we did in 2019. I spent a lot of work on it. And I also acknowledge that it might be a little bit of a different animal. And we did look at the balance, right? Private property ownership and commercial and all that. So. Thank you. I appreciate that, those comments. All right. Um, anything else from anybody? I, I have a few myself. I'll be very brief with them. Uh, first one back to the CCI. Uh, that Wednesday, our meeting is actually the third day. So uh, it actually uh, does have several meetings, including a general session that morning, which most of the commissioners are going to be very interested in participating in. So I think I need, just need to be uh, correct myself. That really is going to be an issue for the county commissioners that are members of our board. The entire meeting finishes by 1130, but then you get into the PPRTA uh, meeting time frame. So I don't know, this might be one of those cases where maybe we consider a different day. And I know that's unusual uh, for us, but, and it'll, it'll be difficult for us to find a good day that everybody can get to. But I'd say most of the county commissioners probably are not going to be at, uh, at that PPRTA, uh, excuse me, the PPHCG meeting because of the general session at CCI. Sure. One thing I'll mention real quick is the Friday before is our workshop date. So that might be an option. We'll explore that a little bit and see if we can um, advance on, on that because we usually get pretty good participation with that. That might be a good, uh, a good alternative because you're right. We do get uh, pretty good participation in that. So let's consider that yeah. idea. Maybe pull around uh, to the board members and see if- uh, no. That that is uh, CML. CML has a legislative policy committee that day from ten to two. Well, it will never work. <laughs> it'll never work. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll just have to work at it and try to figure yeah. something out. <laughs> Too easy. Yeah. And then the one last uh, comment I'd like to make is uh, tomorrow will be El Paso County's uh, State of the Region uh, at the Double Tree. Uh, it is sold out, over 500 participants, so it's going to be a big event tomorrow uh, over lunch. So for those of you that are signed up and going, thank you for being there. Uh, just a quick announcement so you know that it's ongoing. If you want to attend, we actually have taken a few people to sit in a chair in the back. They just can't have lunch, so uh, there's no more seats for lunch. All right. Thank you very much. I have nothing else. Uh, seeing no further uh, business on the agenda, this meeting is adjourned.